Good afternoon, and welcome to the fourth meeting of the committee. Of the committee, we are pleased to present a two-day program on solid earth science and sea level change. Sea level rise is one of the most critical problems facing society today. We need to understand how sea level will change in the future and how it will impact coastal communities and infrastructure. The solid earth plays an important role in unraveling the evolution of sea level over a range of spatio-temporal scales. This meeting will review the state of sea level science, discuss some of the interactions with the solid earth, and explore a number of the important questions that we will still need to answer. Today, we'll begin with introductory talks on sea level, and then follow up with discussions of glacial isostatic adjustment and solid earth deformation. Tomorrow, we'll have talks on vertical crustal motions as constrained from geodesy and relative sea level, followed by a general discussion with all of our speakers. I have a few announcements before we begin. This session is being recorded and will be available on our website within a few days. In addition to questions from our speakers and the committee members, we plan to take questions from the audience. As noted in the previous slides, simply click the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen, type your question in the box and click send. Any questions you submit may be read aloud and included in our video recording. In the interest of time, we will skip committee introductions. Bios of our committee members are located on the Academy's websites and a link can be found in the chat. Importantly, I want to thank all of our speakers and the participants for taking the time to join us today and tomorrow, and I very much look forward to hearing from each of them. I will now turn over to Steve Naram, who will introduce our first two speakers and moderate our first discussion. Steve. Thank you, Torsten. As Torsten mentioned, we look forward to some very informative and interesting talks this afternoon. First, I'm pleased to introduce Ben Hamilton and Chris Pykuch, our two introductory speakers. Uh, ben will go first. Ben is a research scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where he focuses on studies of sea level change using satellite measurements. He's also been the team leader of the NASA Sea Level Change team since 2017. So Ben, take it away. All right, thanks, Steve. Um, so let me share my screen real quick. All right, so first of all, I wanna thank the organizers for inviting me to speak today. Um, and with this introductory talk, I'm hoping to accomplish two things. One is to give a, a framing of societal context to what we're discussing here today. And then also just give an overview of the different drivers of sea level change that are gonna be discussed in the, the talks that follow. So a lot of times we think of sea level as a future problem. I mean, you hear that a lot when we're talking about plans um, that 2100, we're gonna have a certain amount of flooding in coastal locations, but I, I want to try to reframe that a little bit and recognize that sea level rise is an ongoing and current problem. So this is a really nice graphic from, uh, that's been put out by, by NOAA, and it, it really highlights the issue that we have now versus what we saw decades ago. So um, with increasing relative sea level rise over the last century, we've had a decrease in the available freeboard. So freeboard is really the safety gap between where high tide typically occurs and where flooding conditions happen in these coastal communities. So coastal communities were established with this freeboard in mind. They knew where high tide typically is, and they knew that they could build their infrastructure safely above high tide so you wouldn't experience flooding on, on regular time, uh, time periods. But with increasing sea level over the past century, we've seen a significant reduction in the available freeboard in that safety gap. So this uh, image on the left here shows sea level in 1950 versus sea level in 2010, just as an example. And you see how much closer that baseline of sea level is um, to the, the, the infrastructure where people are living. Um, so because of that, this increase we've seen, um, we've seen it an increase in, in flooding as a result. So there's two things, and this is really gonna be the focus of both my talk and also the, the uh, talks that follow. So there's the increase in sea level, which is obviously um, an important factor in terms of re reducing this freeboard, but it's also uh, the land is sinking. So it's this interplay between land and ocean that's really of critical importance when you're talking about the threat of coastal flooding. And there's two types of coastal flooding that occur. So there's the flooding associated with large storms. So you have, for instance, a hurricane coming off the coast and you get a uh, storm surge associated with that. Um, but then you also have what we call high tide or sunny day flooding. So we call this sunny day flooding because it really, it doesn't take a storm. It doesn't take rainfall to drive this type of flooding. 
It's your high tide, potentially a anomalously high, uh, high tide, um, coupled with some other kind of variability. So say the winds are blowing in the right direction on a given day. This all combines and can lead to flooding conditions. And this type of flooding, this high tide flooding has really increased dramatically over the past few decades. And, and in some of these coastal communities, I'm focusing here on the United States, we're reaching a tipping point in terms of the coastal flooding that we're seeing. So in that panel A um, in the middle of your screen here, these are the thresholds. So this is the, um, the gap, that freeboard gap between mean high or high water, so your kind of typical high tide, and then when you start to enter into flooding conditions. This is in meters. And for some of the, the areas around the United States, we're now less than a foot uh, of available freeboard. So it really doesn't take much to push um, from high tide into flooding conditions. And this uh, panel on the right is a um, time series compiled by NOAA. So it really just tracks the number of high tide flood days we see per year around the US coastlines. And you can see this dramatic increase that's happened uh, just in the past couple of decades. So this high tide flooding, it's a, it, it's a current ongoing and worsening issue. Now, if we think about planners and decision makers and what they need at the coast, because of this, uh, of nearing this tipping point, a whole range of processes contributing to sea level change become very important. So it's not just the long-term sea level rise associated with ice melt or thermal expansion. Those are certainly critical pieces here, but all this other variability that happens on different time and space scales becomes very important. So planners are very concerned with this full suite of processes contributing to sea level change. Um, and we can, so this, this figure on the right shows some of these processes and I'll cover some of these in the talk today and others will be covered um, in the talks that follow. Um, but we can attach these particular processes and these time scales. So on the left in blue, I have days to weeks. So those are kind of your storms. And then on the right, those are your century scales. So your longer time period processes, processes like thermal expansion and ice melt. But we can reframe this in terms of the decisions that need to be made on these time scales. And we can even attach dollar costs to this. Right, so these processes and these time scales can be directly linked to decisions. Directly linked to decisions that need to be made. So, um, in the bottom left, there's obviously the emergency response as a hurricane comes up the coast. For instance, there's damage that's done. You have to respond to that, um, uh, repair infrastructure, all that stuff. So certainly that's a big cost. But now you have this mid range. So with the increase in high tide flooding, uh, coastal communities need to plan in their annual budgets how they're going to respond to this high tide flooding from year to year. And then on longer time scales, you have these flood protection projects. How are you going to continue to successfully live in some of these coastal communities, uh, knowing that flooding is going to occur? So again, we have this, it's not just a scientific problem. It's not something we're just interested in for the, the sake of scientific curiosity. There really is real world, real world current impacts into what we're discussing here, um, both in, in my talk and the ones that follow. So the remainder of my talk, I'm going to organize it um, kind of how I laid it out there. So I want to discuss the processes that contribute to sea level change on the largest scale, so global sea level change, and then the processes that um, contribute to sea level change on, on more regional levels. Um, and you're gonna see a, a version, or, or maybe this figure in particular, or a version of this figure quite, quite frequently throughout the, uh, the talks in this, this meeting. It really does summarize um, the different processes and the interplay between these processes and how they contributed to relative sea level change. So I'm going to revisit this and try to uh, frame some of my talk um, based on, on this particular particular figure. Um, so we will. I, I am going to organize this largely by spatial scale in terms of global and regional scales. But um, as part of that, we're, I'm going to address the different time scales. So there is. Um, as I mentioned on the previous slide, other time scales of variability, there's interannual to decadal variability, which plays a big role in what we're seeing along the coastlines, in addition to the centennial and longer um, time scale, which I'll touch on, which will be discussed more in the talks that follow. And I'm going to focus largely here on the modern observation network. Um, as Steve mentioned, I do a lot of work with satellite observations, so that's going to be my, my primary focus here. Um, and I'm going to try to relay how we use those measurements to help us understand processes driving sea level change. All right, so as I said, I'm gonna focus on these, um, these global sea level change uh, processes. And um, there's two primary reasons that sea level is changing on, on a global scale. One is that we have mass driven or barystatic sea level change. So this is really just the transfer of water between land and ocean. Um, there's a couple ways this happens. So one, land ice from the ice sheets or glaciers melts and then that melt water goes into the ocean increasing um, just the mass of water that's in, in the ocean. Uh, the other is there, there can be changes in terrestrial water storage associated with the change in the global water cycle. So the movement of water um, between land and ocean and kind of annual timescales. 
uh, groundwater withdrawal. So if we pull water out of the ground and then put that in the ocean, certainly that's gonna impact global sea level rise and also water impoundment. So if we trap water on land, again, that'll impact global sea level rise. And then the other um, mechanism for driving changes in global sea level is thermal expansion. So thermosteric sea level change really is just the ocean absorbing heat and then that water expands, increasing the volume. Um, so these, uh, I've just uh, highlighted them with the box in red on the right here. Again, I'm gonna use this, this figure as kind of a stepping off point for a number of, of topics here. Um, but I first wanna focus on how we actually measure sea level change. So there's these different processes, but how do we measure sea level change in total? How do we know global sea level is changing? So for the last century, we've used tide gauges. So uh, I think Chris's talk that follows, he'll go quite a bit into tide gauges and how we use those measurements um, to infer different things about the, the processes driving sea level change. Um, but on the right here, I just show a, a couple, an example of um, the San Francisco tide gauge um, sitting there uh, off the coast. These tide gauges are necessarily located on land. So they're measuring relative sea level change that interplay between um, subsidence or vertical land motion and, and what's happening with the ocean. Um, and then these, again, since they're located on land, they have to be located along coastlines or on islands. Um, and you can see the distribution of tide gauges um, in, the, in the bottom panel there. Um, so we have global coverage, although it's certainly biased, you don't have um, a, a large number of observations in the interior of oceans, you need an island, as I said. And a lot of these observations are, are um, biased towards the Northern hemisphere where you have um, more developed countries and, and cities. So there are challenges associated with combining these records and there's been a lot of efforts um, to combine these records and estimate global mean sea level over the length of the tide gauge record. I've listed a few of those there. This, that's not really the, the topic or the focus of this particular talk, but it's really just to note the difference between what we had during the 20th century prior to the satellite records and what we have now. So now since 1992, we can use satellite altimeters to measure sea surface height in the ocean. So in that bottom left, that's a uh, satellite that's gonna launch in just, uh, just a couple of weeks, or I guess uh, a week from Saturday, the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite. Um, but the important thing with satellite altimetry is that it provides near global coverage. So those red lines there are the ground tracks. So that's the, um, basically the coverage of the altimeter over the course of 10 days. So every 10 days it repeats this ground track. And from this, we can take all of these measurements across this ground track, we can average those together and we can get a, a pretty good assessment of global mean sea level since 1992. So just a, a one quick slide on how satellite altimetry works. Um, so it's, it's essentially a, a range finder. So the satellite altimeter sends a radar pulse down to the surface of the ocean. That pulse interacts with the surface of the ocean and then uh, bounces back and returns to the satellite. So the altimeter measures how long it takes for that pulse to get from the surface of the ocean and back to the satellite, knowing very precisely where the satellite is from that, you can then get an estimate of sea surface height. So that's a really simple um, explanation. I'm leaving out some detail there, but that's really the core of how these altimeters are making measurements. And on the right there, I have kind of the constellation, the core um, satellite altimeters that, that NASA has launched since 1992, starting with the Topex Poseidon and then working up to the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite, which is gonna launch again next week, uh, next Saturday. So as I said, from these measurements, we can take these, we can average them all together and you can get an estimate of global mean sea level. And that's what I'm showing here. So this is the time series of global mean sea level rise during the altimeter time period. Um, and from this, you can see, there's a couple features you can note. One is that it's fairly linear, right? So, I mean, you have this increase, it's uh, kind of irrefutable that sea level has increased from 1992 to 2020 to present on these global scales. That rate of rise is about 3.4 millimeters per year, or to put it in terms of uh, inches, about 1.4 inches per decade. There have been uh, studies that have um, pulled out an acceleration of this. So the rate at the beginning of the altimeter record in the first half is smaller than the rate in the second half. So there is an acceleration that's occurring in part of this record. But again, from the altimeter, we have very good measurements of global mean sea level. We know very accurately and precisely how uh, much sea level is rising during this time period. And just to provide one slide of context, um, so in blue here is a, an average of the tide gauges um, from a, a recent paper from Thomas Fredericks. Uh, he took available tide gauges. He uh, made an assessment of global mean sea level over the 20th century, looked at the contributions of some of the processes I'll talk about uh, in the, the subsequent slides and compared that to the satellite data. So just one, one thing to note here, the rate that we see during the altimeter record from 1993 to 2020 is almost three times what we saw over the full length of the 20th century. So we've seen this increase and sea level rise during the satellite era compared to what we had previously. 
But uh, one thing to note too, is that the tie gauges and the altimetry data do match pretty well during the overlapping time period. All right, so we, from these altimeters and the tide gauges, we know that global sea level is changing, is rising. Uh, and we can start to drill down a little bit into the processes contributing to this change. So to start with this first factor, so I'm gonna talk about mass driven or barystatic sea level change. So this comes from uh, the ice sheet melt, from glaciers, uh, and then also groundwater withdrawal or changes in terrestrial water storage that go into the ocean. So I'm gonna focus first on this. And, Due to additions to the observing network in the past couple of decades, we actually have really good um, information and in an improving understanding of these mass driven sea level change, uh, the mass driven sea level changes that, uh, that have occurred in the past couple of decades. Um, so we have ground stations, we have in situ measurements we can use um, to understand what's happening on the ice sheets and in glaciers. We have laser altimeters, so ISAT and ISAT2 are examples of those. And then we have what we call gravimeters. Um, so this is GRACE and GRACE follow one, and that's really what I'm going to focus on here. I'm not going to touch as much on the other two, just in the interest of time. So the GRACE satellites, the, the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. So the GRACE satellite was launched in 2002 and was collecting observations um, up, into, up through 2016. And in 2018, the GRACE follow one satellite was launched um, and is, is up there now collecting information. But these GRACE and GRACE follow one satellites give us information about gravity changes on Earth. Okay, so um, in the bottom left, the, the each GRACE and GRACE following satellite is made up of a pair of individual satellites. And what these, uh, the, the measurement of these two satellites make is really just the distance between the two satellites. And on the figure here on the right, I'm showing a little bit of how, about how this works. So one satellite follows the other. As they fly over the Earth, they respond to changes in the mass, the gravity below the satellites on Earth. So as an example here, you can see the first satellite flying up to this mass, this mountain, um, and it gets pulled towards it. And that separation between the two satellites increases. Um, as the second one then uh, comes closer towards that mountain, it gets pulled. And as the other one flies over, it gets pulled back, as you can see in that third panel. And then as they both pass, again, that uh, those two satellites, there's an interplay between them. By tracking that distance very carefully, we can infer the uh, mass, the gravity below those satellites on the surface of the earth. And as these continue to orbit over time, we can start to get an idea of the mass change that occurs. So one of the, uh, one really key observation these GRACE satellites give us, these GRACE and GRACE following satellites give us is uh, changes in the um, mass, the ice mass on these ice sheets. So here I'm showing the Greenland ice sheet and the mass change during the GRACE record. We not only know that the Greenland ice sheet is losing mass. We also know where that, that mass is being lost from on the Greenland ice sheet. So again, this is a really key observation that these GRACE satellites give us. I'm not gonna let this run through um, entirely, but uh, you can kind of get a feel for what's happening here. And then we can make an equivalent uh, figure for the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, this is not a video, I'm just showing the, the final result here. Again, we've lost mass over the time period that GRACE and GRACE follow and have been, uh, been measuring. Um, and again, you can see where mass is being lost from. And then also um, we can look at individual glaciers um, around, the, around the world and assess how they are also losing mass, how they're changing over this time period. So here on the right is a figure showing a few of these different um, regions with glaciers and, and how they've lost mass as well. So again, this is all valuable information we can get from GRACE and GRACE follow-on. Based on this, we can then assess exactly how much um, ocean mass is changing. So instead of looking at how much mass is being lost on the ice sheets, I'm now looking at the kind of inverse of that. I'm looking at how much mass is being gained in the ocean. So these are this is the change in ocean mass during the Grace time period from Grace or from Grace and Grace follow on. You can see the rate of change from 2002 to present is about 2.1 millimeters per year. Okay, so now shifting gears to the second factor. So um, the other way that global sea level changes is from thermostatic, a thermostatic sea level change. So when the ocean absorbs heat, the water expands, increasing global sea levels in the same way. Um, and we have good observations of this as well over the past couple of decades. So as opposed to satellites, we not, we're now relying on in situ observations. So the Argo profiling floats have been measuring temperature and salinity um, of the ocean from zero to 2000 meters below the surface of the ocean, again, since uh, roughly 2005. So the way these work is uh, they spend most of their time below the surface of the ocean. Um, they drift around the global ocean. There's about three to 4,000 of these in the ocean. I'll show that in the next slide. 
Um, but they collect this information about the water column from zero to 2000 meters. Um, every 10 days, they cycle back up to the surface, they transmit that information, and then again, descend back down to depth making these measurements. So from these measurements, we can take those temperature and salinity observations and we can estimate thermostatic global mean sea level. A couple caveats here, the floats don't measure um, between 2000 meters. So over this full record, we really can't get an assessment of what's happening below 2000 meters. Um, and then some parts of the ocean are, are on sample. So you're relying on these um, floats to freely drift and to, to enter different parts of the ocean. Some areas do not get sampled. So uh, we can assess global mean sea level um, given those, those caveats. Again, it's not quite uh, global mean sea level um, in terms of the thermostatic contribution. And if we look at um, the Argo measurements we have, so um, this is just the Argo measurements that have been attained in the past three days. So this doesn't reflect the full extent of the Argo profiling floats in the ocean, only the ones that have reported data in the last three days. So again, there's, uh, they cycle every 10 days. So there's many more below the surface of the ocean, but you can get an idea of the global coverage, the roughly global coverage we have uh, from these profiling floats. All right, so from that, we can then take this data again, take all those observations, we can average it and we can get an assessment of um, the thermosteric global mean sea level change, global sea level change. And it ends up being about 1.1 millimeter per year over the past couple of decades from 2005 onwards. All right, so based on these observations, we can do what we call the global sea level budget. So this is a very simple con um, computation, it allows us to check these observations we're getting from these three different systems, see how well they agree with each other. So very roughly, the Argo uh, mean sea level plus Grace and Grace follow-on mean sea level should roughly equal what we see with the altimetry. So thermosteric plus barysteric should roughly give us global mean sea level, again, understanding some of the caveats I, I mentioned previously. And it turns out that works pretty well. Okay, so this, I know there's a lot going on in this figure, but the point here is that the barystatic sea level change in green and the uh, thermosteric sea level change in orange, you add those two together, you get the yellow line and it matches up reasonably well with the um, altimetry data. Okay, so from these observations, we have a pretty good understanding of why sea level is changing on global scales and what's driving those changes. All right, so, I now want to shift gears, and, and this is going to start to relate a little bit more to the talks that are going to follow, talking more specifically about regional relative sea level change. This regional relative sea level change is really the what's important for coastal planners and decision makers. You're, it's certainly important what's happening in these global scales. It gives us a good indication of the state of the, the, the entire climate system and how it's changing. But in terms of a planning or an impact perspective, you're really interested in what happens at the local or regional level. Um, so what are the processes that drive departures from the global mean on a regional level? So I've drawn boxes around some of these. So anything that's in orange there is considered a regional driver or that orange yellow color. I'm gonna focus on three of these in particular. So um, large scale climate variability causes changes. Um, when ice melts, it goes into the ocean and it doesn't fill the ocean like a bathtub. There's a certain fingerprint or pattern associated with that ice melt. And then also vertical land motion. Again, it's a, uh, the relative sea level change is partially reflective of what's happening in the ocean, but an equally important part is what's happening on land. All right, so with the altimetry data, I, I showed it we have this global cover, so we can get a, a first look at how different sea level change is on a regional scale versus what it is on a global scale. So here on the right, we can take that data and compute regional sea level trends over the past couple of decades. Um, and there's a couple things to note. One, it's not flat everywhere. Okay, so it's not unsurprising given the process is driving regional sea level change, but we don't see uniform increase across the global ocean. We do see patterns and we see relatively high rates in certain parts of the ocean and reduced rates in other parts. So one particular example that's been a, a really key feature in the altimeter record is the very high rate of sea level rise in the Western tropical Pacific approaching a centimeter per year and then the relatively low rates that we see in the Eastern Pacific, uh, including along the US West Coast, where we've seen relatively low rates of sea level rise during the altimeter time period. So this sea level rise, it's partially related to these longer term uh, or longer time scale features. Natural variability on shorter time scales also plays a role in this. So there's all these different things at play, these processes at play that lead us to this map. It's really key to understand as we try to convey to decision makers how sea level might change in the future. And then just one different way of looking at this, this is just a, um, a quick video, just to give an idea of the roughness and the different features we see in the ocean. So this is the altimetry data gridded up, it's a monthly map 
um, just showing the, the change from month to month. One thing you'll see in just a second popping up is um, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, a really big El Nino that occurred right here in the Western Tropical Pacific or Eastern Tropical Pacific in 1997, 1998. But you see all this different variability occurring um, when you fit the trends, it certainly smooths some of this stuff out, but there's these different time scales and spatial scales of variability in the ocean that we have to have to be concerned with. All right, so just to, for one slide on, on interannual to decadal sea level variability. So there's large scale climate variability that drives changes in sea level on both global and regional scales. And I'll, I'll talk about how we see these uh, signals on global scales in a second. Um, but one, one in particular here, so uh, on the right, I'm showing um, two particular time periods in the satellite record, um, December of 1997 and December of 2015. And uh, both of these were marked by very strong El Ninos that occurred during the, Al the altimeter record. And what we see during these time periods is that regional sea level can change by up to 25 centimeters, greater than 25 centimeters on a year to year basis. So huge amounts of sea level change. And what's noteworthy here is that coastal regions are also feeling this feeling this. So it's not just an open ocean issue. So if you look at the west coast of the United States, for instance, and off the west coast and or the west coast in South America, you see high rates of or um, high levels of sea level associated with these signals. So they can really drive changes on short time periods, impact flooding in these locations. Um, again, not associated with long term uh, climate change, but it's this interannual variability, which can really be a concern to, to decision makers. This is one particular signal, but there are um, other uh, natural climate signals and, and different ocean basins. I've just listed a few here. So the North Atlantic Oscillation, the NAO, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is again centered here in the Pacific and impacts the Northeast Pacific, um, the Indian Ocean Dipole, which impacts the Indian Ocean, but is uh, connected to ENSO in, in some different ways. But there are these large scale dominant signals that impact sea level on these shorter time scales. And again, given that we're close to that tipping point um, in, in uh, coastal communities, these types of signals are actually critically important to understand and to, to understand how they're going to combine with other sea level processes in the future. And just one slide here. So we actually do see um, these signals show up in global mean sea level. So all that uh, has been done here, I showed you that nice uh, linear, uh, relatively um, straight increase of global mean sea level. All I've done here is remove the trend. So that blue line is global mean sea level without the trend. So you do see these variations about the trend. And a lot of these are associated with large scale climate signals like El Nino. So um, I've highlighted a couple areas, I've circled a couple areas in green there. So the 1982, uh, 1982 1983, there was a pretty big El Nino. 1997, 1998, again, another El Nino. Um, in 2010, 2011, there was a very strong La Nina. So that's the opposite phase of, um, from El Nino where you have decreasing sea level in the Eastern Pacific and um, increasing sea level in the Western Pacific. Um, and it turns out that these signals, these climate signals drive precipitation patterns and the movement of water between land and ocean and can impact global mean sea level um, as well as on, uh, on these regional scales. All right, so just to touch on a couple more, and these are topics that are gonna be covered in much more detail in the, in the subsequent talks. Um, so when ice melts or when we move water from land into ocean, Again, it doesn't, the ocean doesn't fill up like a bathtub, right? So there's these fingerprints that um, uh, represent where that water actually goes into the, the ocean once it melts from these different sources. So each source has a different associated fingerprint or pattern associated with it. And you can see here, I, I've, I pulled out uh, four particular locations. So the Antarctic ice sheet in the upper left, Greenland ice sheet in the upper right, um, changes in terrestrial water storage in the lower left, and then changes in glaciers in the lower right. And you can see where ice is being lost, you actually have a drop in relative sea level. So the gravitational pull of, of that particular area is reduced and um, actually water uh, is shifted away from it. Um, on the other hand, and far field from these sources, um, you see an increase or a, a relatively large increase in relative sea level associated with this, this ice mass loss. So as we consider um, melting ice, and uh, the transfer of water from land into the ocean, it's really important to consider how that water is going to move about the ocean and what areas, what coastal communities will be most affected by mass loss from that particular source. And again, there's gonna be talks that uh, this, uh, discuss this in more detail to follow. And then the last topic here um, I wanted to cover is um, vertical land motion. So again, I, I've made the point that we're concerned about the ocean clearly, but we're also concerned about what's happening on land and in terms of the movement of, of land relative to the ocean. 
Um, so vertical land motion is driven by both large scale changes. So what we call glacial isostatic adjustment, and then also in smaller scales by effects like groundwater, groundwater withdrawal. Uh, so, so when you pump water out from a particular location, then that uh, area will, will respond by sinking or subsiding. Um, we do have observations of these in the past couple of decades. So one way that we observe them is through um, GPS. So this is just showing the GPS coverage and the GPS stations maintained uh, or do, um, with the data collected by uh, UNR, the University of Nevada at Reno um, on their website. So you can see the kind of the coverage of GPS across the United States. And then from this, we can actually then assess vertical land motion um, using what, uh, what's called a GPS imaging technique, which I, th I think Bill uh, Hammond will speak a little bit more about tomorrow. Um, but you take those observations and you can create this map um, and showing exactly where we see subsidence versus uplift and um, can start to infer uh, how coastal communities might be impacted by the subsidence. So one no noteworthy thing from this um, in particular, if you look at the East Coast of the United States, you see broad scale subsidence um, approaching uh, on, the, on the order of two to five millimeters per year. So not a small contribution from, from subsidence. Um, if you look at the West Coast, um, conversely, you do see some other features where some areas of uplift um, associated with some different signals. Um, but again, you, with these observations, we can get a pretty good idea of, um, of what's happening on, on these broad scales. Um, and then also GIA contributions to relative sea level change um, are, occur over longer time periods. So these observations here are reflective of and part of GIA changes. Um, and these have to be modeled and uh, available observa observations can be leveraged to improve um, those model estimates. Again, that's gonna be talked about in some of the subsequent, talk subsequent talks. All right, and one final point. So for coastal planners, um, these, so the broad scale assessments of vertical land motion are, are certainly important, but a lot of the adaptation efforts that are being done happen at a very local level. So um, maybe you're gonna raise a particular house, protect a neighborhood, raise a street, issues like that. So information about subsidence and vertical land motion at these higher resolutions, these smaller spatial scales become critically important. And one way we can get at that is through um, interferometric synthetic aperture radar or INSAR analysis. And Manu Shuzai tomorrow is gonna to be talking about uh, this in more detail. I just wanna to point to it a little bit that it's not just these large scales when we're talking about subsidence that matter, the smaller scales are, are, are also critically important. So this INSAR analysis allows us to get at those smaller spatial scales and make assessments closer to the street or community level um, that, that again are critically important to planners and decision makers. All right, so just to summarize and, and point to where we're going with the rest of this meeting. So I really just wanted to highlight today that relative sea level change, it varies on a wide range of spatial and temporal scales. So in terms of a scientific problem, it's a really interesting problem, how these different pieces fit together, how these time scales and spatial scales and the processes um, that vary upon them, how they interact and combine it's a really important question, an interesting question scientifically, but it's also really important to keep in mind that this matters from a societal perspective. Okay, so we've reached these tipping points, flooding is occurring, it's ongoing, it's worsening. These different time scales and the interplay becomes really important from a decision-making perspective. The modern observation network is really valuable. I mean, it's really uh, increased our understanding, dramatically improved our understanding of sea level change over the past couple decades. Um, one thing to note is that these records are still relatively short. So continuity is key in this. So the launch of Sentinel-6, Michael Freilich, for instance, that's gonna continue this altimeter record. That's critically important, but also these comparisons to past sea level records are also very important. You'll, you'll hear some of that in, the, in um, the remaining presentations. It's not just about what we see during the altimeter record, it's how the altimeter record is different or has changed over the, um, over the past, uh, past few decades or, or even not longer. Um, so just to, to finish up, the talks that are going to follow are going to provide detailed looks into some of the processes I've covered. Um, they'll discuss this comparison between past and present observations and really start, start to highlight some of the key questions that scientists are grappling with that really impact our understanding of, of future sea level change. And with that, I will finish up. Thanks a lot, Ben. That was great. Uh, we're going to take a few questions for Ben. Uh, committee members, uh, please raise your virtual blue hand and state your name before you ask your question. Any questions from committee members?
Well, I have a question from the audience, Ben. So why don't we start with a question from the audience? So the question is, how sensitive is satellite altimetry to changes in the orbit? How is that corrected and how frequently? And they relate that to part of the global temperature record controversy involves the adequacy of similar corrections. Right, so the part of, a big driver of the accuracy of our altimeter measurements is our understanding of the orbits. And that's actually a lot of the improvements we've seen from Topex Poseidon on up through the current altimeters is, is associated with that improved understanding of the orbits. Um, trying to, sorry, I kind of forgot the, the flow of the question, but uh, I mean, I, I think I would say that our uncertainty in the altimeter measurements is our understanding and our uncertainty is heavily driven by our knowledge of the orbits. And that's factored in when we try to make these assessments. Um, so again, our, the estimates of global mean sea level our accuracy in terms of that 3.1 millimeters per year is about 0.4 millimeter per year. Um, so again, we know it pretty well. Part of that uncertainty comes from the orbits. Um, but yeah, I think uh, a simple answer is that we know the orbits well enough to make the inferences that, uh, that, that I showed in my, my presentation. Thanks. Uh, Mark, you have a question. Yeah, thanks, Ben. That was a great talk. Um, super interesting. I was curious in, the regional maps that you were showing, there's also a lot of high frequency spatial variability. Is that real or is that an artifact of the processing? I was, because I mean, it looked like there were pretty large magnitude variations over maybe a hundred kilometers or even shorter wavelengths. Yep, so, so that is real variab variability. When I showed the trend map, so some of that variability, that high frequency variability gets aliased in. So I showed the trend map um, which you shouldn't trust too much in terms of the higher frequency, those really small uh, features. But I, when I showed that animation and all the movement of those smaller scale features, that's real variability. <clears throat> Certainly you have to keep in mind the gridding will do certain things to it, but there are these, uh, what we call mesoscale variability in the ocean, these eddies moving around, um, which really play an important role in, in, in the ocean. Um, so in the altimeters are, are very useful in, in our understanding at those scales too. There are future satellites, so the, um, surface water and ocean topography satellite, the SWAT satellite is focused more, is going to be focused more um, directly on those smaller features on the mesoscale, which will provide us even more information. But yeah, short answer is those are, that's real variability in the ocean. Great, thanks. All right, thanks, Ben. Uh, folks, there'll be an opportunity for more questions uh, later. Um, we need to move on to the next talk. Uh, so uh, I'd like to introduce Chris Pipuch. Uh, Chris is a physical oceanographer at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, where he focuses on the physics and statistics of coastal and regional sea level variability and change. So Chris, why don't you take it away? Sure, thanks, Steve. Let me share my screen, one, one second. Okay, so everyone should be able to see my PowerPoint slide now. Okay, again, hi everyone. Um, I'd like to thank Steve and everyone else on the committee for giving me uh, the opportunity to speak to you today. Also wanna to thank Ben for his great introductory talk that segues nicely into what I'll be talking about. Um, so the theme of this, this meeting the next two days is sea level in the solid earth. And in my talk, I'm actually not gonna to talk too much uh, about advances in solid earth and geophysics. I'm, I'm not a geophysicist, I'm an oceanographer. So what I wanna do with my time today is, is use my presentation as a motivation. I wanna motivate the talks that will come, the four talks that you'll hear later today and tomorrow to show how with observations of sea level change, coupled with knowledge of solid earth geophysics, we can actually improve our understanding of ocean circulation and climate change. So uh, as Ben promised, uh, here's this figure again. So it's a, it's a diagram from the uh, recent IPCC special report on oceans and cryosphere. And again, just to remind you what we're, what we're illustrating here is the myriad earth system processes that depending on spatial scale, here, here is um, another version of the same figure. Um, this is a figure from Ben Horton and colleagues a couple of years ago uh, that's trying to get across this, this, same, this same idea that uh, depending on space scale and time scale, there are any number of processes, again, involving an interplay of the climate system, the ocean and solid earth geophysics uh, that contribute to sea level change. So uh, on the left-hand side, Horton and colleagues are identifying uh, different processes, again, geophysical, oceanographic, and climate, uh, exactly those same processes that were indicated in my previous slide. 
Um, and they're indicating how much sea level change uh, that given process can contribute to depending on spatial scale, which is indicated um, uh, by the colors to the left, global in blue and local and regional to the, to the in gray. Um, time scale is on the x-axis on the logarithmic scale. And the color shading indicates the, the, the rough order of magnitude of sea level change associated with that process. So for example, if you look at ocean dynamics, which is the um, first regional process in, in, in gray, and you look at the annual time scale, so 10 to the zero years, you see that this process can cause on the order of decimeters to, to, to a meter of sea level change. Um, there's a lot of um, details here, but I, I wanna really draw your attention to two main points. If, if we sort of take our eyes and go horizontally at any given process, we see that, again, depending on spatial scale and time scale, any given process can be more or less relevant to sea level change. That's one point. Uh, the other point is if we take more of a vertical view and, and so go vertically and pick a particular time scale, we see that sea level changes, if, if we imagine we have observations of sea level changes, often those changes don't represent the effect of a single cause, rather they're the effect of, of multiple causes, okay? So again, what we're seeing is this interplay of, of geophysics and oceanography and climate science all imprinted uh, on, on sea level observations. So, Here's my attempt to, to sort of simplify um, the previous two slides. So this is my version, <laughs> drastically simplified for my purposes uh, of, of what the, the previous two slides were getting across. So again, in this meeting, we're gonna largely focus on relative sea level and its relationship to solid earth geophysics. But what I wanna drive home today is that, again, if we have observations of, of relative sea level change and we have good knowledge of solid earth geophysics, then that informs our knowledge of ocean circulation uh, and climate change. So just to wrap up, I know there were a few hiccups and interruptions. So just to make sure we're all tracking here, here's, here's the, the summary so far. Um, I mean, the premise of this meeting is that relative sea level data are informative of solid earth geophysical processes, things like glacial isostatic adjustment, uh, interior earth structure, et cetera. And my thesis here stated in the middle is that by combining relative sea level data and understanding of solid earth geophysics, we can actually make progress towards understanding ocean circulation uh, and climate change. So today I'm gonna to do, uh, summarize two things. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at past studies that use relative sea level data, either to infer changes in ocean climate in the, in the form of global mean sea level changes uh, or ocean circulation. And I'm gonna pay particular attention to the extent to which solid earth geophysical knowledge is or is not incorporated. So we'll start with global mean sea level. Uh, again, Ben provided me a really nice introduction here, so I don't have to do as much explaining as I was planning on, but uh, suffice it to say global mean sea level, or, or what I'll call GMSL for short, it's an essential climate variable. As Ben described, global mean sea level changes can arise from one of two causes, either barostatic changes, that is you're adding or removing uh, mass to the global oceans, or thermosteric changes, uh, you're expanding or contracting ocean water by, by warming it or cooling it. And so because GMSL changes arise from these two causes, GMSL is an important index of, of land ice wastage, the hydrological cycle, and Earth's energy imbalance, okay? So because GMSL is both practically and, and theoretically interesting, there's a long history of, of, of estimates trying to infer changes in global mean sea level uh, that date back to the 1940s, actually. And all these studies, um, they, they, they use the network of global tide gauges. Um, so, so here I'm illustrating uh, the global tide gauge network. Um, again, global ocean here, each one of these circles indicates the location of a tide gauge and the relative size of the circles indicates how long the record is. So, so bigger circles go with longer records. Uh, and the color shading is the rate of relative sea level change. So I've just simply taken the available data at each site and fit a linear trend. So the yellows are indicating more sea level rise and the blues are indicating sea level fall. Um, and so all of these studies, going back to the very beginning, the early studies uh, by Gutenberg in 1941, for example, all these studies uh, recognize two things from the start. One, something that should be obvious looking at this, at this plot, is that relative sea level data from tide gauges uh, are spatially and temporally uh, inhomogeneous. They're heterogeneous. Uh, for example, if we look at Western Europe or uh, North America, we see uh, a lot of dots and a lot of big dots, meaning that there are a lot of long tide gauge sea level records in these regions. Uh, contrast that with looking at places like uh, the South American coast and parts of the African coast, uh, where you see fewer dots and smaller dots and sometimes no dots, okay? So uh, studies from the very beginning recognize that to estimate global mean sea level, one has to cope with the spatio-temporal uh, heterogeneity of the data. 
Uh, the other thing that studies recognized right from the beginning, again, going back to Gutenberg and before, is that clearly these relative sea level records are influenced by solid earth geophysical processes that are entirely unrelated to global mean sea level changes. This is perhaps most uh, clearly evidenced if you look at the, at the deep blue colors around Scandinavia, which are indicating rates of sea level fall on long time scales associated with post glacial rebound and the glacial isostatic adjustment process. So it was recognized right away that uh, these solid earth geophysical effects would have to be dealt with. They are the signal to the global mean sea, uh, excuse me, they are the noise of the global mean sea level signal. Um, so what I thought would be useful is, is, to, um, is to summarize past studies in terms of how they, they dealt with, with this geophysical signal. So early studies, again, starting with Gutenberg in the 40s, but going up to uh, Eugenia Lizitsin in the 1970s, and even some uh, studies today, uh, the strategy is to avoid tide gauges from regions that are thought to be uh, dominated by solid earth geophysical effects. So for example, those tide gauges uh, from Scandinavia would not be used, for example. And this is how many authors uh, proceeded for, for, for many decades until about the 1980s, uh, when folks like Vivian Gornitz and Ian Shannon started to not necessarily avoid data from regions that were affected by uh, geophysical effects, but rather use paleo proxy records of long-term geological rates and correct the tide gauge records. The premise being, if you estimate the long-term geological rates and subtract them from the tide gauges, then what's left over is more closely related to global mean sea level change. Starting around the 1990s, you start seeing the availability of global uh, glacial isostatic adjustment models. So similar to those practices in the 80s, you have folks like Dick Peltier and others that will use models of the glacial isostatic adjustment process, again, to correct those tide gauges under the assumption that uh, the models accurately simulate the glacial isostatic adjustment process and that GIA is really the, 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 the most important geophysical effect on the tide gauges. Uh, at the turn of the century, in the 2000s, you have, you have a couple important developments. Uh, one is that uh, folks like Jerry Mitrovica and others started to include not only models of the GIA process, but other solid earth geophysical effects. Things, for example, the spatial patterns that, that Ben uh, alluded to a few minutes ago related to the elastic fingerprints, uh, spatial patterns uh, of sea level change related to contemporary ice melt. And this is really nicely demonstrated in the somewhat recent paper by Carling Hay in 2015. So that's one development in the 2000s. Uh, another is that by the 2000s, we've started to collect sufficiently long records of crustal motion from global positioning system data, GPS data. And so the idea here is that we're removing land motion effects as measured by GPS from the tide gauges, essentially taking a relative sea level measurement and putting it in a geocentric frame. Uh, so early studies by Guy Vopelmann and others, and more recently exemplified by Sonke Dangendorf in 2017, uh, demonstrate this approach. And as we move into the, into the last decade, what we've seen is a more and more comprehensive accounting of solid earth geophysical effects and a more comprehensive uncertainty quantification. So exempt, for example, studies like Hay et al. 2015, and also studies more recently by Thomas Fredericks uh, include uncertainty in GIA models, as well as those uh, elastic fingerprints. So here's, um, I'm trying to, on, on one plot, summarize all the past literature on, on uh, post-industrial or industrial era global mean sea level trends. So let me explain this plot a little bit. Uh, each box corresponds, corresponds to a different study. Um, the, excuse me, the vertical thickness of the bars indicates that the error bar of any given global mean sea level trend where we have rate on the, on the Y axis. And the X axis uh, is essentially the period over which that trend is computed. Uh, and finally, uh, the color of the box indicates what year um, the estimate was published. And long story short, the history of global mean sea level estimates is typified by an increasing amount of solid earth geophysical knowledge being brought to bear. And consequently, these estimates grow more consistent and less uncertain, such that you know, in the beginning, estimates were kind of all over the place and ranged anywhere from uh, basically no rise to up to three uh, millimeters per year of rise. But over time, over the last decade, we've converged to estimates uh, against the 20th century rate to be between one and two millimeters per year, and in fact, in the past five years, we've really been converging to these lower numbers between one and 1.5 millimeters per year. So we've of estimates in recent times. 
Uh, not only that, not only do we know uh, rates of change over the 20th century, now we're able to also independently attribute the causes. So Ben made uh, allusion to the, the, the sea level budget. He was talking about it in the context of satellite and modern measurements. Uh, we can also now do this over longer time scales. So here are some results from a recent study by Thomas Fredrickson, essentially re resolving what was known a couple of decades ago as, as Monk's Enigma, saying that we were unable to attribute the causes of past sea level rise. Well, uh, Frederick said here exemplifies how we can do that nowadays. Um, so there's a lot going on here, but let's look at panel A, for example, a uh, couple different curves here. Um, the blue curve in panel A is Frederick et al's estimate of, of 20th century sea level change on an annual basis. Um, the black curve is essentially the sum of all the causes. Remember the thermostatic and barostatic contributions that Ben mentioned. Uh, and in fact, those, those individual barostatic and thermostatic effects are given in red and orange here. So again, the point is, is that not only can we diagnose these changes, we can also diagnose the causes. Um, not only that, we can also identify acceleration in sea level rise. For example, as discussed earlier by Slanka Dangendorf last year, and again, more recently discussed by Thomas Fredrickse, if we look at panel C, we're looking now at global mean sea level trends. That's the rate of change. Uh, again, blue is the total change, uh, whereas black is the sum of the contributions and red and orange are the barostatic and thermostatic respectively. I want you to look in panel C at the blue curve from 1960 to about 2010. What we see is sort of a, a linear increase from about the 60s uh, to the modern. Uh, and again, these are trends. So it's an increase in the trend or an acceleration in global mean sea level. Okay, So we can identify these higher order features of the past sea level record. So long story short, if you come away with anything here is that we have a, a really good understanding of, of 20th century global mean sea level change and its causes. So, so what's next? Well, I would suggest we start looking at a, a longer geological time scale, specifically looking at the late Holocene uh, or the common era. Why do I highlight that, that time period? Well, a, a couple of reasons. One is it, perform, it provides a, an informative uh, sort of longer term geological context within which to put modern rates of sea level change. Uh, the other is a bit pragmatic. There's a, a relative abundance of proxy sea level records with things like salt marsh sediments, uh, coral micro atolls, et cetera. So here are a few of the only available estimates of common era global mean sea level change. Uh, the earlier estimate by Aslan Grisgend and others is shown in yellow is actually based on, uh, is a temperature based estimate actually. Um, the orange curve from Andy Kemp from 2011, this is based on salt marsh sediment from North Carolina. Uh, essentially in that study, the authors uh, removed uh, an estimate of GIA from a model and essentially assumed that what was left over um, was, was global mean sea level. Um, arguably the most comprehensive and authoritative estimate we have of common era uh, global mean sea level is the blue curve from Bob Kopp and colleagues. And, and what this represents is a uh, probabilistic assimilation of a global database of, of high resolution common era proxies. Uh, and what's really interesting about the Kopp et al curve is that of course, if we look far to the right to the last century, we see the uptick, uh, the, the modern acceleration in rates of global mean sea level rise. Uh, but what's really, really interesting in, in the broader common era context is that there are all these bumps and wiggles in the pre-industrial common era. That is, there is prominent centennial and millennial scale variability that we actually don't know the causes of. So I'm identifying this as a potential area to try to study more. What are the causes of those centennial to millennial scale fluctuations? Kopp et al show that there is a relationship to surface temperature. But at this point, it's unclear to what extent these represent thermostatic or barostatic changes, or to what extent they're driven by greenhouse gases or, or solar variability or volcanic activity, for example. Um, there are also other areas where solid earth geophysical knowledge can be brought to bear to, to make better and more robust these estimates. For example, one caveat of the COP et al study is this, this issue of identifiability. Um, they were unable to unambiguously identify the long-term rate of pre-industrial change. And they had to assume that global mean sea level rate between zero and 1800 common era uh, was zero. And they acknowledged that, uh, that assumption. So with better geophysical knowledge, we can perhaps lose that assumption and have better knowledge of how sea level change on millennial time scales in the pre-industrial era. And finally, uh, we wanna improve the representation of solid earth geophysics in these models. So, so the, the way a lot of probabilistic algorithms work is that you assimilate um, sort of sparse data and you share that information across space and time according to specified covariance functions. So uh, I'm giving an example here um, of, of two covariance functions related to the GIA process uh, at New York City, where I'm showing the star here. Um, so on the left is the covariance function used in the COP et al study. Um, and you see this sort of yellow bullseye right around the New York region. You can interpret saying measurement uh, at New York. 
uh, how far afield does my probabilistic algorithm allow me to share that information? And so in the comp study, it's a relatively local neighborhood of New York City. Okay, so compare that assumed structure to the structure on the right. So this is the essentially the error covariant structure of the GIA process at New York City with all other sites from a suite of GIA models where we're varying the lithosphere thickness and the mantle viscosity and the ice history. Okay, and we see a very different structure here. For example, we see uh, far field regions of strong covariance. For example, if we look at Northern Canada or even over uh, just north of Scandinavia, we also see anti-covariance. So, so these structures are very different. They're important because these structures are determining how information is shared across space and time in these models. So we wanna to move to more realistic representation of geophysical models. So the point here is I'm identifying some areas where, where climate scientists and solid earth geophysicists could work more closely to advance our knowledge of common era global mean sea level. So about halfway through now, let me, let me switch gears uh, to sea level and ocean circulation. I'm gonna sort of shamelessly focus just in the North Atlantic here. Uh, so large scale North Atlantic ocean circulation uh, plays an important role uh, in climate variability and abrupt change, carbon cycling, ecosystem productivity, and a bunch of other fields. So suffice it to say, there's a lot of interest in knowing how North Atlantic ocean circulation has changed over time, uh, but there's a problem. And that is that measuring the circulation is both difficult and expensive. Um, so past changes in climate relevant features of the circulation, things like the overturning circulation, they're not very well constrained uh, and they represent a key uncertainty related to climate change. Uh, just so everyone's on the same page, I know not everyone uh, is an oceanographer here. Um, I'm sort of sketching a little cartoon um, of, of the North Atlantic circulation. So all these arrows are indicating different, different uh, circulations. Um, I'm just noticing right now that I've indicated that Greenland has three E's. Apologies for that. Um, anyway, uh, the, the, the red arrows uh, indicate sort of warm surface currents. And what we see if, if we follow those, those, those red arrows on, on the bottom, we see this arcing uh, clockwise motion, which traces out the subtropical gyre, which involves things like the Gulf Stream and the North Atlantic Current, and is predominantly driven by the surface winds. Uh, but we do see that some of those red arrows travel further north, bringing warm, salty waters to the northern North Atlantic, uh, where they encounter harsh conditions, they densify, they cool, and, and they sink to depth and, and return uh, equatorward. And that's indicated by the yellow arrows and the, and the blue arrows. Um, so, so that's, again, a, a cartoon picture of this complicated circulation. What do our observations look like? Well, here's a schematic of the modern day Atlantic circulation observing system. So uh, to the left is a map and all these different colored lines show the nominal locations of different uh, contemporary observing arrays. This is summarized from a paper by Eleanor Fraka Williams last year. Uh, on the right, uh, I'm showing some of the data uh, from, those, from those sites. And, and so we have time on the x-axis on the bottom and transport, so ocean circulation transport, a volumetric rate indicated by sphere drips uh, on the various y-axes. Um, this is, I should emphasize, this, this is, these data are a remarkable achievement in the context of ocean observing. However, if we're interested in long-term change, um, these, these records are just not, uh, not long enough. Um, so what do we do? Where does sea level come in? Well, the basic uh, fluid dynamic equations of, of oceanic motion suggest that um, changes in large scale features of the circulation, things like the vertical overturning or the horizontal gyre, these things I just mentioned, it turns out that, that changes in these circulation features are in fact manifested in and then coupled to changes in sea level along the Western boundary. So if we're interested in the, the North Atlantic Ocean, our Western boundary here is the East Coast of North America. Um, I'm showing some kind of cartoony equations here that, that try to illustrate this. So this psi VO, this is the, this is the transport of the vertical overturning circulation. Uh, you can demonstrate based on simple conservation principles that this should be, this should be rail, directly related to uh, zeta W, which is sea level on the Western boundary. Uh, this other cartoon equation, psi HG, this is the transport of the horizontal gyre. Again, through basic physics, you can show that this should be related uh, to the, uh, the, the latitudinal structure D by DY, where Y is latitude of sea level along the coast, divided by F, where F is the Coriolis parameter, uh, a, a, uh, a function of latitude. Okay, so again, the idea here is that through basic physics, uh, these large scale features are coupled to what's happening at the coast. Uh, none of this is new. Um, I, I don't want to claim any novelty here. This has been recognized for almost a century. And in fact, there are studies dating back to the 1930s that try to exploit these physics to use tide gauge records to say something about ocean circulation, uh, and particularly the Gulf Stream, again, going back to the early studies by Montgomery in the 1930s. Uh, and in fact, not just the Gulf Stream, a lot of these papers focus on the Gulf Stream at its origin at the Florida Straits, what's otherwise known as the, the, the Florida Current. I'm trying to illustrate that region here in these maps. So 
Uh, on the left, we have the Western North Atlantic and the color shading here is uh, surface ocean currents. So blues are more sort of slower, more sluggish currents, whereas yellows are more rapid swift currents. And, and what you see here is that you have a, a whole sea of, of blue, except starting around Cuba and Southern Florida and the Bahamas, you see that the emergence of this bright yellow snaking band, again, right below Florida. And this of course, again, is the origin of the Gulf Stream. So I'm zooming in there with that red box and showing the region to the right, again, this is a zoom in of Southern Florida and Cuba and, and the Bahamas. Um, all of the black and, and red lines across the ocean here are the locations of historical measurements. I should clarify also that the color shading now indicates ocean depth, not speed. So I'm trying to exemplify that this is a very narrow, shallow region the Gulf Stream passes through here. So the historical direct ocean transport data are, are, are sparse, but You'll notice in both figures here, I have all these gray squares and, and gray circles. These indicate the locations of long tide gauge records. So people have exploited the fact that the Gulf Stream here is so trapped by the topography, so constrained by ocean depth that we can use uh, uh, ocean, uh, coastal sea level measurements. Um, and so again, most of those studies I cited in the previous slide do that. Um, one thing I should clarify, um, Remember my earliest slides where I was showing either this, this map from the S rock or this, 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 this figure from Ben Horton's figure at different time scales, different processes are responsible for sea level change. So with that knowledge in mind, physical oceanographers have made assumptions when they've analyzed these tide gauge records. Specifically, they assume that at the high frequencies, anything you're measuring by a tide gauge is related to oceanographic processes, whereas at the low frequencies, this is all uh, solid or geophysics. Um, so they've done one of two things. They, they've, they've typically um, removed a trend from the tide gauge record, again, assuming that that's uh, largely due to uh, things like isostatic adjustment. However, that, that causes two problems. Uh, one is that it implicitly assumes that once you remove the trend, you, know, you no longer have solid earth geophysical effects in your tide gauge record, which is, which is not, strictly speaking, true. Uh, it also precludes you from looking at possible ocean circulation changes on the longest time scales because you just remove the trend. Um, but again, this, this sort of procedure is really typical of most studies. Um, here are two, two examples. Uh, again, so what we're doing is we're looking at tide gauge records uh, in this Southern Florida or Bahamas region versus transport. So on the top right, uh, this is results from an earlier paper by Islin. In, uh, Islin. Uh, and he is using, uh, he's plotting uh, sea level data from a few tide gauges along the southeast. And, and note that sea level was on the y axis, but he's, he's inverted the axis uh, so that positive values are to, uh, to the bottom and negative values are to the top. This is because sea level is inversely correlated with transport. Uh, and he's interpreting these sea level changes during the 20s and 30s in terms of changes in the Gulf Stream. So if you look at this time series, he infers that there was a, a strong drop in the Gulf Stream transport at around 1931 to 1933 or so. Uh, that's the inference he draws from the, from the tide gauges, but there were no uh, concomitant uh, transport measurements to, to corroborate that, that hypothesis. Uh, on the bottom left is a more recent paper um, by Mall and colleagues from the mid 80s. This is from the Stacks experiment. Uh, kind of a busy plot, but bear with me here. So we've got about a year and a half of data from the early 1980s, uh, data both of, of transport measurements, uh, transport shown in volumetric rate on the, the left y axis and sea level on the right y-axis. And uh, so the, the thicker lines are, are the transport measurements, the thinner and dashed lines are, are, the, are the sea level measurements. And I should clarify, uh, the sea level measurements are the sea level difference, sea level in the Bahamas minus sea level on the Florida coast. This is what you expect from uh, geostrophic balance, the, the fundamental momentum balance in the ocean. Uh, point being is that all these various curves are correlated. They're correlated uh, and this suggests that you might be able to use um, coastal tide gauge records as, as a low cost observing system for ocean circulation. But again, all these studies are, are looking at the high frequencies. Uh, just this past summer, I published a study where I, I try to tackle this problem head on. In other words, I try to tackle the problem of trends. So, so I used um, all those tide gauges I indicated in, in the, the previous map slide, along with available transport measurements to try to estimate Florida current transport changes, to try to estimate Gulf Stream transport changes over the past 110 years. And, and here, here's the result. So, so this is my estimate of transport. Again, time on the x-axis, transport in a volumetric rate on the y-axis. Uh, the thick line is the, is the median estimate. The, the shading and dashes uh, are, are different measurements of uncertainty. I won't go too much into the details. And the, the solid thin lines are two members of the ensemble. So it's an, an ensemble-based estimate of, of past transport change. 
And the key point here is, again, remember, I haven't removed the trends from the tide gauges, and I'm identifying a likely decline in the Florida current over the past century. And this is consistent with, with independent studies based on other proxies that the larger scale overturning circulation has weakened over that same time. Now, crucial to my estimate was, was that, again, I'm, I'm looking at the trends in sea level and trying to distinguish what component of those trends is due to solid earth geophysics, things like tectonics or glacial isostatic adjustment, and how much is due to ocean dynamics. And, and, and the relevant quantity here is the trend in the sea level difference across the Florida Strait. Again, remember, I'm looking at the difference sea level in the Bahamas minus sea level in Florida. Okay, this is the relevant quantity for inferring circulation. So I'm showing here in this bar graph, different estimates of that uh, sea level difference trend. Again, the difference across the straits and the trend in time. Uh, anything that's labeled as modeled is something that I've estimated in my study. Anything that's indicated as observed is an independent data set that I've held in reserve and not included in my probabilistic estimate. And what I wanna show here, so again, rate is on, is on the bottom. Uh, the, the horizontal thickness is a measure of uncertainty and the, the, the vertical thickness has no significance. It's just so you can see it. <laughs> um, so if we start at the top at the modeled relative sea level trend, again, this is the difference across Florida Straits, we see that it overlaps zero and there's not much of a significant change uh, in, in the sea level difference over the study period. However, that sort of zero trend actually is the canceling out of two different processes. One, there, there's a positive trend across the straits, that is sea level rising higher in the Bahamas, due to what I'll call isostatic processes. This is where your solid earth geophysical effects would come in. That's, this is the blue box on the second row. And there's a negative trend in ocean dynamic sea level. This is on the, the fifth row down in orange, okay? So it's this canceling out. And in fact, if you compare to independent data, uh, they corroborate this. So if, if we look at the second, third, and fourth rows, again, I have my modeled isostatic rate. I'm comparing that to the rate of sea level rise inferred from GPS data, and also the, the rate of long-term change uh, inferred from proxy records from uh, mangroves and salt marshes. And admittedly, there's some uncertainty here, but the, the qualitative story that there is, that there is a, a, a positive trend is consistent. Uh, likewise, if we look at the bottom two uh, rows, again, the orange is my modeled trend in dynamic sea level. The yellow is what you get from satellite altimetry, which, although it's uh, over a shorter period, gives the same sense, the same sign of trends. So again, the, 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 the important point here is, uh, is I've tried to infer circulation changes on the longest time scales. So this is encouraging. That encourages us to do a few things. One is, again, my record only goes back to uh, the early 1900s due to the availability of tide gauges. We should go back further in time. A few ways we can do this. One is to recover old archival records, such as exemplified by Stefan Palka. Uh, another is to use uh, high resolution paleo proxies, uh, as I hinted to a moment ago, for example, from salt marshes or coral micro atolls. Uh, and this would allow us to test an earlier hypothesis based on uh, Delta 018, so oxygen isotopes, that the Florida current strengthens coming out of the Little Ice Age. Um, spend a lot of time talking about the Gulf Stream, but there's nothing special about that in the sense that we can do this kind of study elsewhere. And so I would encourage using long tide gauge records elsewhere to try to estimate other ocean currents. Uh, Kristen Richter provides a nice example uh, in the case of the Atlantic inflows to the Nordic Seas over the past 50 or 60 years. Uh, the caveat in that study is that she and her colleagues did remove that linear trend. So I think that this issue should be revisited in that region, but trying to deal with that linear trend issue. And of course, there are long tide gauges elsewhere. Um, what I think is particularly salient in the context of a, of, a, of a meeting on solid earth geophysics are these long records in places like Japan and New Zealand, which potentially uh, can tell us about past changes in Pacific Ocean circulation. Of course, one has to contend with things like tectonics, uh, which presents an, an interesting challenge. Uh, and finally, it'd be good to explore, explore more generally these growing global databases of high resolution proxy records. So I've gone over time a little bit, and I apologize for that. Sorry for the initial hiccups. But I'll quickly summarize. So um, again, I hope I've convinced you of, of the following. One is that relative sea level records have motivated fruitful collaborations between solid earth geophysicists, physical oceanographers, and climate scientists. Uh, and the history over the past 80 years of global mean sea level study shows us that as we improve our understanding of solid earth geophysics and incorporate that in the GMSL studies, we improve and make more consistent our estimates of past global mean sea level change. And I'm suggesting that those global mean sea level changes provide a blueprint to studies of ocean circulation where there hasn't been as much collaboration and progress towards estimating past circulation changes based on sea level records. So it's an encouragement to move forward there. So 
finally, to sort of point to the four talks that you'll see in a little bit, what do we need to make progress on these processes uh, and problems that are identified with the circulation and climate? Well, broadly speaking, there are two categories, again, which my colleagues will speak to in a few minutes and, and tomorrow. First is we need to improve models, both the geophysical models and others. Uh, we need to improve the spatial and temporal resolution and scale that we can resolve. Uh, we also need to improve our understanding of interior earth structure and ice history, which we'll hear more about this afternoon uh, from Pippa and Jackie. Um, also really important, uh, you know, part of the reason why GIA has featured so prominently in the history of sea level studies, it is, it is that by and large, it's been the one solid earth geophysical study for which there exist publicly available global models. And so we need to move forward and have models of other processes and, and feedbacks between them. And finally, as we, as we have more models, more data, we need to also develop in tandem probabilistic frameworks that can assimilate in a mathematically coherent fashion all these disparate data streams. Uh, and, and finally, in addition to the models, of course, we need to grow the observations in space and time, things like, like Ben has hinted to, and we'll hear more about tomorrow. Uh, we need to grow uh, and lengthen the GPS network. We need to start exploiting more remotely sensed data like INSAR, and of course, keep growing these, these global paleoceanographic uh, proxy archives. So with that, I'll take any questions. And again, apologies for, for the hiccups initially. Thanks, Chris. That was great. Uh, so we have time for a few questions. Uh, Torsten. Thanks, Chris. Uh, great presentation. Asking uh, a little bit the question that also came up in Q&A that we'll probably revisit. Uh, the business about fingerprinting, right? We, you and the previous speaker alluded to this. We have an understanding for how different ice melts should be expressed, and, and we know that the ocean system is is very much you know part of that. And so I wonder if you could comment on the the scales to which they they interfere and to the scales to which they decouple. I mean, how much of the fingerprinting um, can we do given the uncertainties in the ocean dynamics? Yeah, no, great question. So again, I'll caveat this with, this is an oceanographer's perspective and I would uh, defer to my geophysics colleagues to give more uh, technical in input, but I can speak to a couple aspects. Um, the, the in so you asked about interference and coupling. Um, I'll speak more to the interference. So I'll translate the question of to what extent, um, so I made, I made the comment that a lot of ocean dynamic studies assume that once you remove the trend from a sea level record, You've, you've essentially removed all the solid earth geophysical effects and, what, and what's left is largely an ocean circulation and climate signal. That's just not true. Uh, and there have been a, a number of studies specifically, for example, along the East Coast, I'm thinking of things, uh, papers by Jim Davis and Nadia Vinogradova, uh, also uh, earlier work by Thomas Frederick said that has showed that, for example, recent accelerations along the US East Coast, particularly south of Cape Hatteras, so this is along Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas, much of that acceleration in recent decades has an important contribution from melting of land ice. And, and, and also uh, Thomas Fredericks in his papers has looked at longer time scales over the past 50 or 60 years and showed that that sort of uh, ice, and mass, uh, ice and water mass flux uh, matters a lot for these decadal fluctuations. So certainly, it, strictly speaking, it's not true to assume that decadal variability in a tide gauge is just due to ocean dynamics. So in that sense, uh, again, we, we understand very well if, you, if you're given uh, an amount of ice melt or water mass redistribution, uh, knowledge is fairly good about how uh, the, the fingerprints will respond. So we know the fingerprints, so the, the objective there is having a good history of ice melt, say the Greenland ice sheet or, or of mountain glaciers, things like that. So uh, we have a lot of that knowledge. There's been a lot of progress in sort of, a, in sort of recording and estimating past changes in, in land ice. Uh, and again, we, we know the fingerprints fairly well and their uncertainties. So it's just a matter of, of having a little bit more communication between the geophysicists who have that knowledge and the oceanographers. And, and again, there are a few papers that do this, but we need more of them. Okay, Chris, uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, let's, I wanna bring Ben into the discussion here and have the two of you kind of address questions together. Uh, we can take questions from the committee. If you raise your, your virtual hand, we can take questions from the audience through the Q&A feature. Um, so, uh, anybody have a question they want to bring up or I can bring up one of the questions, uh, from the audience. Let me go to, uh, uh, one of the audience questions and I'll paraphrase here, but they are asking, and this could be either for Chris or Ben, you can decide which one should handle it, but they're asking if long-term changes in atmospheric pressure have been considered in studies of sea level change. 
Go ahead, Chris. This is, uh, right so right. there, there was the PhD thesis a few years ago. Um, that was, so yeah, no, the, the, yeah. So I wrote my PhD on this. Um, this is certainly considered. It's 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 a it's an effect that is especially important at short time scales and 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 high latitudes. So this is the so-called invert, inverted barometer effect. So by and large, uh, when you have changes in barometric pressure. Um, they will affect sea level change, but it's largely passive. That is, it doesn't couple to changes in ocean circulation. Um, and as I said, these effects tend to be more important at, at high frequencies and high latitudes. But as we start talking about these multi-decadal changes um, over the global ocean, um, they, they tend to be less important. There are isolated incidents um, that, that of course one needs to be aware of, um, but this, it's, it's more of a, a quantitative thing. It doesn't really, I would argue uh, on the whole, doesn't make much of a, of a, of a um, qualitative difference. And I should clarify that, especially if we're talking about global mean sea levels, since, since ocean water is largely incompressible, uh, atmospheric pressure doesn't have any effect uh, on, on global mean sea level. All right, thanks. I got another question from the audience, uh, which is kind of a big picture question, which I think is important to address here. So the question is, where do the biggest uncertainties lie and what new observations are most important to understand regional sea level change? Yeah, so I mean, I think Chris and I might have slightly different answers or different perspectives. Um, so, so I'll go first. But um, I mean, in all of these processes, I mean, there's a lot of science still going on, a lot of uncertainty on, on all of these. So, I mean, in, in terms of one of the biggest drivers uh, of rapid sea level change along the coast, I mean, certainly what's happening with the ice sheets um, and, and what could trigger a rapid change in the contribution from those ice sheets. I mean, that's certainly a big driver on these longer time scales. Um, but, but also something as simple as knowing, uh, knowing what's happening at the coast, right? So the, I talked a lot about the altimeters. Those altimeters don't give us observations right up to the coast. So there's this mismatch a little bit between our open ocean observations and what we see with tide gauges and some of these near coastal processes. Um, and, and obviously we're really interested in what's happening directly at the coast. That's where the impacts are happening. Um, that's where you start to have some of these questions of vertical land motion, what's happening there versus what's happening in, in the ocean. So um, there, there are certainly observations that are needed, I think we would all say for different things, but I mean, improved new observations of the ice sheets, um, I think is important for uh, rapid increases in, in sea level in the future. And then more observations in that near coastal um, environment, I think are, are very critical too. So we can get that information closer to the coast. Yeah, I would, I would second some of the things that Ben said. Of course, there's the issue of the ice sheets, and that's sort of often the, the elephant of the room, especially as we go to, to longer time scales. Um, the issue of, of, of the coast, really, really important. Again, these tide gauges that I spoke of, um, they give really good information about spatial scales along the coast, but they are really blind to, to offshore scales, uh, which if you combine that with the, with the issue Ben mentioned about uh, altimetries, sort of the current, the current generation of altimeters being somewhat degraded for, for various reasons within 10 or 20 kilometers of the coast, there really is this sort of zone uh, near the coast that we're, we're really uh, sort of blind to and, and don't have good knowledge of. Um, and that goes for the ocean physics too. There's a, there's a lot of developments in physical oceanography right now that are trying to understand a little bit better. I may be guilty of oversimplifying in, in, in that slide I had with the, with the cartoon equations. There's a lot of really subtle questions involved in terms of how a change in the large scale circulation is, is transmitted to to the coast. So there's a lot of questions there. And the last thing that I'll add, and this is basically just to, to, to plug the, the talks that'll come up, is vertical land motion. Uh, like I said, you know, there, there, if, if I could have redone one of my slides, you, you could also trace the history, say, of, of, of ocean dynamic studies or global mean sea level studies in terms of <laughs> um, uh, the assumptions that are involved in terms of land motion geophysical effects. Again, you know, ben, ben showed that nice figure of the available GPS data. Uh, but even with that, that really dense GPS network, one has to make, you know, often those GPS stations aren't co-located with a tide gauge, for example. So one has to make assumptions when sort of mapping from the GPS data to a tide gauge in terms of determining, you know, how do we correct a tide gauge for vertical land motion effects? Uh, and there are various ways of doing that, various assumptions uh, folks make. Um, but I would argue that our, our knowledge, and I'm hoping to be surprised and encouraged by the talks that come, is that right now, the, the knowledge of, of, say, the magnitude, spatial scales, the time scales of vertical land motion um, are, are, are relatively unknown in this context. And, and we see this more and more as, for example, Ben showed some, some figures from California. Uh, there's the uh, recent work presented by Brett Bazango looking at the, the, the Norfolk region using INSAR and GPS. They're all, there's all this very large magnitude, short spatial scale behavior that's critically important for sea level and coastal flooding that's only just now coming to light. That's a crucial, uh, crucial uncertainty. 
Thanks. Uh, Cindy, do you have a question? Yes, I do. I, I think I, um, well, let me just ex um, give a bit of background. I, I'm um, hoping that my home in New Orleans isn't part of our experimental sea level guide um, or reference sites, but um, no, engaging in, in looking at the coastal environment in this near shore, it's non-trivial and particularly in areas of active sedimentation um, to decide it, to, because there are added signals. And you, how are we going to work in this near shore area and how far along are we in cooperating or collaborating and capitalizing on the num large number of uh, industry wells in um, that that are actually pinned very deeply and stably. And I, how is the community, how, is there any progress or any motion in the community to try and capitalize on the, on the existing infrastructure in the near shore offshore areas? Yes. So I may, may I take first stab at that? I mean, so I, I don't know broadly the answer to your question. I do know there's specific efforts to improve our understanding on those spatial scales and, and in the coastal region. So, so for instance, NASA has a program called Delta X, an observation program, which tries to combine airborne, uh, spaceborne, and, and in situ observations in the, the exact region you're talking about. So try to really saturate um, a particular area with observations um, making some of the connections you're referring to and, and seeing what improved understanding we can get out um, uh, and, and to potentially help some of these areas that are threatened. Um, yeah, again, I mean, that, that's, I think what you refer to as a big area for, for coastal communities, you, you obviously have one specific case or, or location. I think a, a similar thing could come up in, in other locations too. But um, yeah, I don't know, Chris, if you have any, anything, any specific examples or general thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll sort of, I guess, echo you. I mean, I, I don't have the answer. And I think that you, you identify a really, really crucial, important that we need to make improvements. And, and again, I don't know the answer, not because they, the answer doesn't exist, but because that's sort of beyond my um, expertise. But again, uh, I can speak to a few things that, uh, that, that I'm aware of that are sort of more generally sort of moving uh, towards that knowledge. I mean, one is the sort of the, the, the proliferation of, of citizen science. You know, a lot of uh, coastal towns, again, Norfolk being, being one example where, there, where, where, where these sunny day nuisance high tide flooding events are becoming more and more frequent, you know, everyone's noticing it. And there's, there's efforts to sort of um, use citizen science to better map the geography of coastal flooding. So again, you know, if, if you look at the tide gauge data that I've been showing, uh, you know, a city might have one tide gauge, you know, and, and, and the geography of coastal flooding is really complex and you're not gonna, you're gonna alias all that spatial structure if you have a single tide gauge in a location. So, you know, crowdsourcing, you know, the citizen science is one way. Another, um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm thinking of, of, of folks down at Georgia Tech, for example, and, and other institutions that are trying to develop low cost uh, coastal sensors that are, that are deployable en masse. You know, you wouldn't be looking for the same sort of stability and accuracy of say a NOAA tide gauge, but you would want to have, you know, you know these, these sensors that could be deployed around a, a coastal community or, or a city that would be able to, to better um, to map, you know, when it, you know, when it floods, where does it flood and why? Because again, you, you really can't get at that kind of uh, sort of granular information with, with the tide gauge network. So people like um, Amanda Di Lorenzo and Kim Cobb at, at Georgia Tech are spearheading efforts like that, say in cities like Savannah and, and efforts like that are ongoing uh, in, in other cities too. So those are those are two of the efforts that I'm aware of. Again, they don't speak specifically to your question and, and, and geographic region, um, but those are the things that I know of that more generally uh, get at the issue you're speaking of. Hopefully that's informative. Oh, I was, I was looking to the general question. I just kind of made a joke um, about my, my specifics. Uh, Maya, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I just have a quick question for uh... Ben, you were talking about the importance of uh, regional signals and you showed this uh, amazing plot from Southern California where you have Anaheim going up by, I think it's seven millimeters per year and then um, Lompoc going down rapidly. Is that just tectonic effects or what's, or is it water table? What, what's causing those kind of drastic changes? Yes, yeah, so I can actually um, point to Manu Shirzai's talk tomorrow. He's, I, I think that plot was actually from his work. So he'll, he'll go over that in detail. Um, I don't want to step on his toes, but yeah, I think just a very, very general answer to your question. I mean, there's a lot of different processes contributing to this local 
um, these local effects. And it's sometimes surprising how local the vertical land motion signals can be, which again, that just points to the importance of the NSAR analysis that he'll talk to. So okay, he'll, he'll give good answers to, to those that question. Thanks. Uh, Torsten, do you have another question? Um, I, I guess mainly for Chris, I wonder, I mean, it's clear that the problem of estimating local relative sea level is, is complex in terms of its uncertainties. And, and I guess I wonder, you know, if, I, if I'm a policy planner and I want to have information, say, for the next 50 years, right? So I can see how the long-term uncertainty obviously has to do with what we do with our carbon emissions, right? What's going to happen. But sort of, you know, in, in maybe on a, on a slightly shorter time scale, if I were then to ask, well, what are the uncertainties? Are there data products out there that, that would provide that given like a local estimate of uncertainty for a certain time scale? And can we turn our understanding of the dynamics around and ask for a specific application, what are the additional data sets that we needed, that we would need to collect, right? Can we turn it around and say, all right, for this question, really, it's the relative tide gate. It's for this question, it's the 50 kilometer scale geodetic uplift that would make the most impact in terms of doing a better job and mitigating these changes. Yeah, no, great question. And, and I think in your question, you're sort of moving towards the answer. I mean, the, the answer is, I mean, it depends. It depends on spatial scale and time scale, as you're hinting to and you know, alluding back to those earlier slides that I showed at the beginning of my talk and that also Ben showed in his talk. Right. So the answer is going to depend on where you are, when you are, and what scales you're talking about. Um, but, but roughly speaking, if, if, you're, if you're talking about not the, the deep long term, say 50, 100 years, if you're talking more so the next decade or two decades, uh, you know, that, that, is a, that, is a, that is a time scale, a time horizon where um, sort of the, the, this natural variability of the ocean atmosphere system, things that, that Ben mentioned, natural climate modes, for example, things right. like it's the North Atlantic Oscillation or ENSO. I mean, you can, you can frame it in that language. You can also frame it equivalently sort of different side of the same coin of looking at, you know, variations in ocean circulation, which for all intents and purposes, you know, might be sort of random and, and sort of stochastic going into the future. I mean, it really is that those, those, those coupled and climate then, processes. Yeah, that, so, and like better quantifying and so and things like right. that. Right. Yeah. So, so, right. So, 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 so speaking very broadly, that's going to be on a large scale, one of the most important processes. So that being said, our, 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 you know, predictions are only as good, our predictions of sea level, for instance, on those time scales are only as good as our predictions, say, of ENSO or future changes in ocean circulation. And that's, that's getting to an uncertain place. However, while I might not be able to say 10 years from now, whether or not we're going to be in a positive or negative ENSO phase, you know, you can start thinking of these bulk statistics that, you know, that, that, that are informative to someone like a planner. For example, Phil Thompson at the University of Hawaii has come up with a really innovative um, flooding tool uh, that gives that sort of incorporates these longer term projections with tides and, and storms and decadal variability, all these things together to project forward year by year. What are the odds that any given town or city um, will experience X number of days of flooding? And what's helpful there is that, you know, while the uncertainty is it can be large for any given year, you can start imagining computing things like, okay, well, I, I'm not concerned with 2041 per se, but tell me if I'm considering 2040 to 2050. You know, what are the odds that one year in there, we're going to see, you know, 20 or 30 flooding days? I mean, that, that sort of knowledge, that more bulk aggregated knowledge is really, really informative. And we're moving towards being able to make statements like that. Again, it's, it's partly a, a function of ocean dynamics. Tides do come in, storms do come in, long-term sea level change comes in, but we can start making those general statistical um, mm -hmm. statements. But again, if we're making a particular prediction, it's only going to be as good as our predictions of those component parts. Gotcha. Thanks. All right. Uh, well, thanks everybody. Thanks, uh, Ben and Chris. Those were excellent introductory talks to the focus of this workshop. So, uh, sorry we didn't get to everybody's questions, um, but we're going to take a little break now. And to, for about 30 minutes at two o'clock uh, Eastern time, we'll come back and with, with more talks and Mark will introduce our next two speakers. So, uh, everybody uh, go grab a coffee and uh, we'll see you back here at two o'clock Eastern time. All right, well, welcome back everybody. Um, our next session this afternoon is gonna focus on solid earth deformation and glacial isostatic adjustment. We will have two speakers in this session, uh, Pippa Whitehouse and Jackie Osterman. Um, and Pippa will speak first. 
Uh, Pip is an associate professor in the geography department at Durham University in the United Kingdom. Her expertise lies in modeling the processes of glacial isostatic adjustment, which consider feedbacks between ice dynamics, sea level change, and solid earth deformation. And her talk today will focus on neglected processes, the role of the solid earth in controlling ice sheet contributions to sea level change. Um, Pippa, I'll turn it over to you. Fantastic, thank you. Let's just see. Um, I think I've shared my screen. Can someone confirm you've seen the right slides? Yes, it looks great. Fantastic, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, thanks for the for the introduction. Um, thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, and thanks to, to Ben and Chris for mentioning um, the elephant in the room, which is the ice sheets. Um, I've bent the rules a little bit here. Um, the remit was to talk about solid earth and sea level change. Um, I'm going to bring ice sheets into that equation. Um, and in particular, I'm going to think about um, how um, solid earth change influences ice sheet dynamics, um, which obviously then has a direct influence on sea level change. Unlike uh, perhaps all the other talks, I don't have a picture of the, the sea in the background here. I've um, got a picture of the ice sheet, um, the, the largest ice sheet, Antarctica. Um, and what we have here is um, one of the, the GPS instruments um, installed by Polnet, uh, the NSF funded project, um, which is measuring earth deformation in response to ice sheet change. Um, and not only does that tell us about ice sheet change, but it tells us about the rheology of the solid earth. It tells us how the earth behaves when you force it with a surface load such as ice change or, or sea level change. Um, and we really need to understand the rheology to understand these feedbacks between ice sheet dynamics and, and solid earth deformation. Um, so I sort of um, flagged up there that the, the large ice sheets um, exert a primary control um, on long-term sea level change. Um, just uh, changing something I can see a bit better. Um, and I've included here the, um, the figure which um, the earlier speakers showed as well, looking at the, the contributions to sea level change. Um, and Jackie Austerman queried whether I should um, talk about neglected processes in my title, but actually the process I'm gonna talk about um, is, is not quite on here. Um, so the, the processes around um, the role of the solid earth in controlling ice sheet change. Um, and so what I'd actually like to do is I'd like to take this little GIA symbol um, over here and I'd like to add another symbol um, which says GIA underneath the ice sheets. And that's really what I'm gonna talk about, how the land deformation under here influences the dynamics of the ice sheet and how that feeds into sea level change. Um, if I was gonna add something, I'd say our, our understanding is sort of low to medium on this and the strength of this process, the sort of details, um, but the timescales are actually medium. It's something that can happen um, relatively quickly. Before I dive into the detail, um, I decided to include this, this take home message, which really captures the essence of what I'm going to be talking about um, for the next 25 minutes. Um, and that is that um, we understand a lot of the, the theory behind what I'm gonna talk about, but we don't understand the detail. We don't understand the strength of the feedbacks between ice sheet dynamics and solid earth deformation. The thing that we do know at the moment is that it really depends on the earth rheology. Um, and Jackie will talk more about this, about how we're mapping out 3D earth rheology. And one of the reasons we're doing this is to try and understand the rheology beneath the current um, remaining ice sheets to get the strength of these feedbacks correct. This is the, the last of my introductory slides. Um, and I just thought it would be important to, to touch on why it's important to understand these processes. Um, the first thing to say is that um, ice sheet change, um, models of ice sheet change have actually included a component of subsidence or rebound in them for a number of decades. Um, so it's, it's been included um, in, in sort of some of the, the original ice sheet models that were developed to, to model continental scale ice sheet change. But until recently, we didn't really think about whether that representation, representation of solid earth deformation was accurate or not. We included it, but we hadn't really tested whether the parameters were, that we'd chosen were correct. Um, and we hadn't really thought about are there other details in there, um, perhaps from a solid earth community, um, that actually needs to be included um, as we're modeling the ice sheets. 
Um, and the reason it's important to get these processes right is because they're included in models that are being used to predict future change. So we've, we've had sub subsidence and, and rebound um, included in models for a while, but we're including more complex versions of, of those processes now. Um, and we need to get those details right. Um, those models are calibrated often on their ability to reproduce observations. Um, and I've mentioned past change here. Um, and actually, this can include relatively contemporary observations. So we have good observations of contemporary ice sheet change. And some of these models are being tuned on the basis of whether they reproduce those observations on a decade or scale. We also more traditionally tune ice sheet models on their ability to reproduce much longer term um, change, perhaps over um, sort of the last deglacial cycle. If we are tuning these models, we need to make sure that we've represented the processes right in the models. And we also need to make sure that we've interpreted the data correctly that we are then using to tune the models. And if we don't do that, um, then we can end up um, with biased models. Um, and I'll just bring you back to the first point up there um, that these models are being used to predict future change. If we over tune the models um, with the incorrect processes, to some data that we don't fully understand, then we're going to end up with biased projections. So hopefully that's a little, um, little piece of motivation for why we're digging into some of the details here. The structure of my talk, um, I'm gonna have three sections here. Um, I'm going to talk about some key concepts, in, in fact, three key concepts. Um, I'll then talk about two areas of recent advance um, and then three areas where I think there are open questions um, that still need to be tackled. So the first of these concepts, um, much of this talk is about how the solid earth influences the ice sheets, but I'm going to start the other way around and I'm going to talk about how the ice sheets influence the solid earth. Um, some of you will be familiar with this process of glacial isostatic adjustment. What I've done here is divided it up into two time scales. Um, when we have, um, for example, the melting of an ice sheet, there's something that happens straight away. We refer to this as the elastic response. As the ice sheet shrinks, the land underneath um, rebounds upwards. And of course, we're taking meltwater and putting it into the ocean and the sea level changes. Um, so the global volume of the ocean increases. There's also, as part of this sort of instantaneous process of changing the shape of the geoid. Um, and Ben referred to this in his talk at the start that um, the, the gravitational attraction of a ice sheet is so large that it deforms the sea surface. As the ice sheet shrinks, um, the mass of the ice sheet is smaller and locally the height of the sea surface will fall. So although the volume of the ocean has increased um, in this instantaneous um, idealized uh, representation of an ice sheet melting, close to the ice sheets, the sea level is falling. And these are the sort of processes that are, are represented when we talk about a sea level fingerprint. And I'll come to that in my next slide. But this is a, a snapshot of why we see these patterns. The other time scale um, that I'd like to talk about is the viscous time scale. And that's really what happens after that instant um, movement of ice into the ocean and response to the solid earth. And this is really about um, the time decaying deformation of the earth. It's about this ongoing rebound that happens. Um, there's rebound where the ice sheet was. There's deformation also under the seafloor due to changes um, in loading across the surface of the earth. This affects the height of the sea surface. Um, in this idealized scenario, I'm assuming there's no change in volume of the ocean, but there will actually be changes in relative sea level because of this relaxation process. Um, so the, these are the two processes um, that I'm going to talk about. And I'm, I'll come back to these a little bit. A lot of the research um, to date has assumed um, an elastic response to ice sheet change. I'm going to talk about some areas where we have low mantle viscosity. And the important thing about low mantle viscosity is that what that means is that the earth can respond faster than average in response to a surface mass change. And so I would argue that in some areas where we've got ice sheet change, we need to be considering whether there's a viscous response to that ice sheet change on relatively short timescales on the order of, of decades. That was the first key concept. Um, the second one I will mention here is about fingerprinting. And this has been mentioned a couple of times. Um, and this is a classic um, sea level fingerprint 
um, of the pattern of sea level change that you would expect if we had melt from Greenland and West Antarctica totaling um, one millimeter per year. And you see this far field sea level change, which is greater than the mean value. So it's greater than one millimeter per year. And this near field sea level change, um, where we actually see a drop in relative sea level. And for the purposes of this talk, um, it's this feature of the drop in sea level in the near field of the ice sheets, which actually plays a very important role in controlling ice sheet dynamics. Um, this is very much a, a signal of, of contemporary change. Um, what's been um, hinted at in the other talks is actually there's, um, if we're thinking about relative sea level change around the world, there are other processes going on, one of them being the ongoing response to past ice sheet change. So we have this background GIA signal, and this is, this is the instantaneous signal that we'd expect with ongoing ice sheet change. Um, the reality is um, a little bit more complex, um, and we saw a range of fingerprints earlier from um, terrestrial water storage, perhaps other sources um, of ice sheet change. So this pattern um, can be adapted, um, basically, depending on where we think we, we know there is um, ice sheet change or indeed water storage change. Um, something else to bear in mind is um, that concept that I mentioned about um, low viscosity regions. In areas where we think the mantle is relatively low viscosity, such as beneath Iceland, perhaps Alaska, Patagonia, and the Antarctic Peninsula, we think that instantaneous ice sheet change, so I'm talking over a couple of years, five to 10 years of ice sheet change, might actually trigger not just an elastic response, but also a viscous response, in which case these fingerprints get a little bit more complex um, and they evolve through time. Um, and there's sort of very, there's a, a couple of papers here, which I've mentioned, which go into the detail of what's going on there. This is very much a, a contemporary um, idea of what's going on. Um, we, nowadays we can map out um, ocean change. We saw in Chris's talk, um, there's the beautiful sort of altimetry um, observations that's going on that we have. Um, if we go back into the past, we're much more restricted in the information we have about the pattern of sea level change, which could, you could argue can be in, used to infer the pattern of ice sheet change. We're very much restricted to, to relative sea level records around the coastlines. And as you can see from this detailed map of sea level change, it's really important to get sea level records that cover the whole of this area of change. In particular, if we're thinking about the polar ice sheets, then getting a, a good north-south distribution um, of records of sea level change captures these sort of gradients that are in these predictions. So it's actually quite difficult to, to reconstruct past um, sea level change from fingerprints um, because of the restrictions of, of um, where we actually get the data. Um, there's an important caveat here. Um, as we saw from the satellite altimetry data, the, the contemporary pattern of sea level change doesn't look anything like this um, because we have um, primarily the steric component of change that's going on. And that's something which um, I think is actually uh, needs more research if we look into past sea level data um, and think about what are the potential steric um, uh, biases in the data. Um, are there differences in tidal range or ocean circulation that are being recorded in those sea level records that we're not accounting for when we're just thinking about that global GIA process? Um, if we're thinking about the solid earth, then a couple of areas to think about is whether, um, as came up in one of the questions, whether sediment loading has an impact on um, what's actually recorded in a paleo relative, relative sea level record. Um, and then on an even longer time scale, whether dynamic topography feeds in. So these are all other factors to bear in mind if we're trying to tune models using the data here. So that's a summary of how ice sheets impact sea level, um, the last two slides. The last of my key concepts is going to move to the ice sheets. And again, this is a figure from the recent special report on oceans and cryosphere and the uh, changing climate. Um, and it takes a snapshot through a marine ice sheet. So the third concept I'm going to talk about is the marine ice sheet instability. Um, Antarctica is a marine grounded ice sheet, which means that it flows um, from the continent directly into the ocean. Um, and an important um, thing to get your head around um, is this concept of a grounding line. And that's essentially the point where the ice stops um, being grounded, um, touching down on the bed, and it starts to float. 
Now, the, the dynamics of an ice sheet depend on the thickness of ice at the grounding line. Essentially, the flux of ice um, from um, into the ocean um, depends on this thickness. And this is demonstrated here by the fact that as the ice sheet retreats to a deeper position, the thickness of ice increases. And you can see that these arrows increase. So as the ice sheet retreats, if the, the bed is sloping downwards, the flux of ice increases and we get into a runaway scenario. And that's the marine ice sheet instability. Um, and so these are these scenarios um, which predict the potential for very rapid collapse of the ice sheets if they're perturbed into this um, sort of unstable situation. Um, the, so I just, sorry, I missed a few uh, bullet points there. Um, so on this um, bed, we, we get um, uh, unstable ice loss. Now, something to bear in mind here is that models often assume a constant sea level. Um, there is a little bit, uh, a little arrow here, which talks about rebound. Um, and I'll come on to the, the effect of that in a moment. But, but quite often we think about the sea surface being constant. If we're driving ice sheet models, we're perhaps using a, a eustatic sea level curve of what we think the ocean did in the past. Um, and the details are a little bit more complex, um, which plays to our advantage if we're thinking about trying to um, find ways of slowing down ice sheet loss. So those are the, um, the three key concepts I wanted to introduce. Um, and I'm just going to talk about two areas where we have recent advances. Um, and we're really getting into the, the cutting edge of the processes that are being thought about in, in recent research. The first of these is the stabilizing effect of GIA. And I hinted at that um, in the previous slide, the idea that the bed will uplift as the ice sheet thins. Um, what I've taken here is this, this um, image on the left, and just there's a little bit more complexity here, but I've emphasized the idea that the bed rebounds over a large spatial scale as the ice is losing mass. Another thing that happens is the sea surface falls. This comes back to the fingerprint and the idea that close to an ice sheet, you have relative sea level fall. Even though in the far field we have sea level rise, we actually get a reduction in water depth at the grounding line as the ice sheet retreats. So this is a negative feedback um, and it helps to stabilize the grounding line, process, um, the grounding line position. Um, it might slow retreat, it might stop retreat, it could potentially cause re-advance. Those are the details that we don't understand yet. Um, but the details largely depend on earth rheology. It depends on how quickly the land responds to the ice loss, and it depends on the spatial pattern of that rebound as to whether it can influence the, the um, water depth at the grounding line sufficiently to slow down the retreat. That's the theory. Um, over the last sort of um, seven or eight years, these have been implemented into models. Um, this was the, the first and, and still the, the neatest representation of this process, um, worked by Natalia Gomez. Um, in the top image, um, she has not implemented any GIA feedbacks. And in the bottom one, we do have this rebound process of the solid earth and the slight decrease in the height of the sea surface. And you can see going from dark blue to light blue in the upper picture, um, we have runaway retreats, and in the lower, lower picture, um, that rebound is stabilized. Um, thinking about um, sort of longer time scale processes, um, again, um, sort of uh, shortly after this um, uh, process was identified, um, Baz de Boer ran this um, simulation through multiple glacial cycles, including these feedbacks. So that's the, the coupled model that we're talking about here. And it's interesting that these discrepancies between the coupled model, the solid line, and the, the standard model, the dashed line, um, actually occurred during glacial maxima. So this is the, the volume of the Antarctic ice sheet down here. And he predicted that we, he couldn't actually model as large an ice sheet if we included these feedbacks. So not only do these feedbacks damp the rate of grounding line retreat, um, this shows that they also damp the rate of growth of an ice sheet. It's really sort of a, a way of putting the brakes on um, the dynamics of the ice sheets, and it can some, and potentially reduces the interglacial glacial variability of ice sheet volume. Um, this is very much looking at um, sort of past change here, and um, uh, sorry, um, and so something that um, this sort of fed very quickly into is the idea of how this might influence future ice sheet change, and this is where we started to think more carefully about mantle viscosity. Model predictions show that 
the GIA process can reduce rates of future ice sheet loss. There's a couple of papers um, from 2015 now um, where the authors ran projections into the future where ice sheet dynamics was coupled to GIA processes. And they demonstrated that if we include both the feedbacks, but especially the feedbacks where the mantle viscosity is very low and that rebound kicks in very quickly, um, then we can limit um, the rates and maximum amount of ice loss in the future. Um, these are very much proof of concept, um, um, asking the question of can, can this process help? Um, the next step was to move into thinking about, okay, what, what are the details here? What is the mantle viscosity which is low enough um, that it's actually going to be able to prevent um, future ice loss in a large scale way? Um, this is a, an article, uh, sorry, a figure from one of David Pollard's papers a couple of years later. Um, this is quite an extreme scenario. So this is an RCP 8.5 scenario. Um, the dashed line here is the CO2 forcing. Um, and you can see that the CO2 forcing is so strong that we completely lose the ice sheets. Um, we've got, uh, well, lose West Antarctica and certain portion of East Antarctica um, with the sea level rise shown on the left here um, within about a thousand years. What happens from that point onwards when the CO2 um, uh, returns to much lower levels is that for this pink line, the ice sheet starts to regrow. And this pink line is the one with the lowest mantle viscosity. It's where this rebound kicks in and helps to stabilize the remaining ice sheet, and the dynamics of the ice sheet. At the other end, um, as you might expect, the, uh, the blue line at the top here, that's the one with the strongest um, mantle viscosity. So that's the one where the rebound process is not as quick and it doesn't provide this um, same damping effect on ice sheet dynamics. So this starts to tell us that we need to understand the mantle viscosity under Antarctica to know which of these trajectories we want. Um, these models um, applied a single mantle viscosity underneath the whole of the ice sheet. But actually, we know um, the one thing we do know about mantle viscosity in Antarctica is under West Antarctica, it's much weaker and under Eastern Antarctica, it's much stronger. So we need to home in on the details a little bit. Um, just earlier this year, there was a, a study uh, around Pine Island Glacier, which is one area where um, we do know the mantle viscosity is very very low because we see the rebound happening so quickly in the GPS measurements. Um, and this study demonstrated that if you have the lowest um, mantle viscosity, it's this upper line here, then you reduce the amount of sea level rise that you predict on sort of a decade or centennial timescale. Um, so going through these, these um, this range of predictions, the, the lower one here is one where there's no feedbacks and we get the maximum amount of ice loss when we include feedbacks, particularly with a weak earth model in the Pine Island region, then we reduce the rate of ice loss. So we're getting there. We're starting to, to nail down the details of, of what these trajectories might look like if we know the mantle viscosity. The ultimate step here is to use one of these coupled models and implement um, uh, spatial variations in mantle viscosity across the whole of Antarctica. And I'll show, you, I'll show you in a couple of slides time that we don't fully understand the details of the mantle viscosity, but we do know that if we include spatial variations in mantle viscosity, it makes a difference. This is the difference between um, two couple models, one with a simple earth structure and one with a detailed earth structure. Um, and we can see that the sea level, um, relative sea level predictions make a difference. Um, so including those, um, the 3D earth structure makes a difference to the sea level predictions. This is 15,000 years ago. So it's essentially talking about what is the water depth around the grounding line at that time. And we need to get that right to get the ice sheet dynamics correct. Those were two areas um, where we've seen relatively recent advances. Um, so hopefully you're now getting an idea that um, GIA helps stabilize ice sheets. Um, and if we have a weak enough mantle viscosity, actually that stabilization um, is much, much stronger. Um, so I'll just go into the last um, couple of slides where I, I posed a few open questions. The first one is what the details of that relationship between earth deformation and ice sheet dynamics. Um, the right hand figure here, you've actually seen before, this was from uh, reproduced from the Pollard paper, um, but it had this very strong RCP 8.5 forcing. The left figure here um, is less strong forcing. Um, it's a doubling of CO2. 
and it looks at the trajectory of the Antarctic ice sheet over a couple of thousand years. Um, the black line is, is one with no feedbacks, um, so we get this runaway ice loss situation. The red one includes feedbacks, but it uses a strong Earth model. The blue one uses one of these weak Earth models. So we can see that um, on the side here, this is a global mean sea level um, implications. We prevent the collapse of West Antarctica. Um, there's nothing we can do about it, um, particularly we can't change mantle viscosity, um, but it will be prevented if the mantle viscosity is lower under West Antarctica versus if it is stronger. Um, I think what we really need to think about here is try and understand what trajectory we're on. Um, does the rate of climate forcing matter? Does the rate of the ice loss matter in terms of the way that the rebound is triggered in response to the ice sheet change? Um, the next step here, these are, these are from 1D models, 1D Earth structure, is to map out the viscosity. Um, there are two ways to do this um, that I'm going to summarize here. Um, the first one is to think about the idea of an understanding of surface mass change and a measurement of how the Earth responded to that surface mass change. If we have those two things, we understand the rheology. So if we know how the Earth's forced, we know how it responded, that's a measurement of rheology. And this is an experiment which has been going on um, in the Antarctic Peninsula recently um, due to the rapid ice loss that is going on. But we have this network of GPS instruments and um, the pink um, dots here on the left, um, which are surrounding this area of ice loss. This is um, altimetric measurements of ice sheet loss since 2002, following the breakup of the Larsen B ice shelf. Um, and on the right here, um, I show the GPS measurement from one of these sites from the Palmer Station. And we can see um, the rapid ice loss commenced in 2002, and we see this drastic um, change in the rate of rebound um, of one of these instruments. Um, so this is work from Grace Neal's PhD. Um, she modeled the elastic response to ice sheet change. That's the, the red line here. And it gets nowhere near the rebound that we were seeing in the GPS instruments. She then searched through a range of viscosity values and identified the one which gives us the best fit to this change in rate. And it's around 10 to the 18 Pascal seconds, um, which is several orders of magnitude to global average mantle viscosities. So we're starting to be able to nail down what is the viscosity at this location due to this sort of natural experiment that's going on? Um, and this is something which has been um, picked up by um, a large number of authors since using this GPS network. The second way, um, just um, so we don't have these instruments everywhere, we don't have this sort of natural experiment going on everywhere. So we need to map out mantle viscosity in a much more independent way. And I know Jackie is going to talk about this in a lot more detail. Um, but essentially, um, the approach that can, we can be used um, is to map out um, seismic velocity perturbations, which is what is shown in this figure here, which help us understand mantle temperature distributions and hence viscosity. Now, there are many assumptions um, as you go from seismic velocity perturbations to mantle viscosity. Um, and so this is basically all I'm going to say is there are, there are probably more questions than answers um, at the moment here. Um, and so this is not something that um, we can take and map out absolute values of mantle viscosity and start to implement to models. There's a lot more research needs to be done to understand how we do that. Um, and I will just mention um, the added complication um, if we go to, to lab experiments um, and look at mantle rheology, um, we see that actually the, the viscosity of the mantle probably depends on the stress that is applied and if you think about it, the stress that's applied is the ice sheet change, and that changes through time. So there's a question of whether the viscosity actually evolves through time, as well as being spatially variable. Um, and the final question um, I'll just mention um, here is thinking about um, the past. I talked about how we use models um, to predict the future, and we often tune them to see if they can represent what's happened in the past. Um, on the left here, um, there's a, an image of uh, a model reproduction um, of the, the retreat of the West Antarctic ice sheet. Um, and what's actually happening here is the ice sheet retreats. Um, it retreats back to this pinning point, uh, retains an ice shelf. And then we have this rebound process. And what happens is not at the grounding line, but this high point here touches down on the base of the ice shelf and the ice shelf regrounds, which is quite a threshold process with an ice sheet, changes the whole stress regime, and the ice sheet starts to re-advance 
back to this pinning point. So you can see there's a lot more subtlety here, um, which comes down to um, evolution of, of those floating ice shelves is absolutely key and understanding the bed topography underneath Antarctica. Um, so if we're trying to run ice sheet models and reproduce the past, these are the sort of details we need to be thinking about um, representing in those models. Um, just very quickly, I'll make a quick mention um, of longer time scales. This is not to do with rebound in response to ice sheets so much, but the idea that topography has changed on a um, million year time scale. So this is a recent um, article from Guy Paxman um, where he used reconstructions of the bathymetry 34 million years ago um, compared to the present day bathymetry and asked the question of what happens if you try and force an ice sheet model on those two different topographies and you actually get very different answers. So the sensitivity of the ice sheet to climate forcing depends on the topography that's underneath the ice sheet. This is my second to last slide. Um, we were asked to think about ways to tackle some of these questions. Um, the first point I've put here is to um, think about other ways we can measure the rebound of this, uh, sorry, the well, uplift or deformation of the solid earth as it's forced by surface mass change. Um, I agree with um, the earlier speakers that we need um, more um, observations of surface deformation. I'd love to throw this one out. Um, I'd, I'd like to know what, surf, uh, what earth deformation is underneath the ice sheets um, and underneath the oceans, if we could map that out um, in a large, much, much larger scale. Um, and whether there are ways of trying to get at past deformation um, in a smarter way. We use relative sea level records, but the, the, um, the resolution, the accuracy there is relatively coarse. Are there smarter ways to understand past surface load, um, surface deformation? If we're thinking about modelings, um, then there's two areas which um, I think the field will continue to head towards. One is data inversion, um, so the use of data um, to tune models, and the other is coupled modelling. Um, I've got my notes in front of me here. All I've put here is that if you get ice sheet modelers together with GI modelers, that's a really good idea. Um, and if you can bring in people that understand data and the uncertainties, that's even better. Um, so that's my last point here um, is to really, um, we're moving towards um, a better treatment of uncertainties. And that's in, in the data, um, but also in the models. Um, and as well as understanding those uncertainties, I'm sure this will come up in questions, um, we need to be moving towards the idea that we, we can't just find the right answer, um, but we need to be thinking about these probabilistic approaches to understanding all these processes. So this is my summary slide. Um, hopefully you've seen that actually sea level change regulates ice sheet dynamics, which in turn obviously affects sea level change um, and that the details depend on earth rheology. We need to account for feedbacks um, in models um, and also when we're interpreting data. That doesn't mean that all models need to be fully coupled or fully 3D, but we need to understand what's in the models, what we need to correct for, and potentially what we could parameterize in the relatively simple way and, and do a good enough job. Um, and then the last area which I touched on is trying to map our earth rheology. Jackie will talk more about this. Um, and this really has implications for a, a wide number of areas. I've talked about ice sheet dynamics. And I'll just touch on this one here. Current um, reconstructions of global ice sheet change over the last 20,000 years have largely been um, built assuming a 1D Earth. It's, it's a massive sort of inversion and data tuning exercise to, to build these models of what the ice sheets did. Um, we need to revisit some of this and think about, do these um, still hold? if we actually build them on top of some sort of 3D earth. Um, so I'll just um, show here, uh, just to close my take home message, um, that to be able to predict future sea level change, uh, we need to understand the strength of the feedbacks between ice sheets and solid earth deformation. And we know that this depends on variations in earth rheology. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for that excellent talk. Um, we're right at 2.55, so what I think we'll do is we'll go straight on to Jackie for her talk, and then Pippa, when we come back in the end, we'll have questions straight for you and then for both of you together. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, so next I'd like to introduce uh, Jackie Osterman. Jackie is an assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia University. 
and works to understand how sea level and ice sheets have changed over the past hundreds and thousands and millions of years. Um, her work uses large scale numerical simulations to quantify the magnitude and rate of sea level change in response to warming temperatures and to unravel the interactions between solid earth processes and the paleoclimate record of Earth's geologic past. Uh, her talk today is going to be entitled Using Paleo Sea Level Records to Image Earth's Internal Structure and Decipher Drivers of Sea Level Change. So, Jackie, thanks a lot for joining us today, and please take it away. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, let me pull up my slides. Does that look good? Yeah, that looks perfect. Okay, fantastic. Let me make this small. Okay, excellent. Well, I also want to start by just thanking the organizers of this. It's really, it's been really great to see already the talks and and engage on this topic. Um, and also thank all the participants because I know Zoom fatigue is real. So I really appreciate everyone um, being here today. It's fantastic to speak after Pippa and after everyone else, which already you know lays the groundwork for a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about. I also have a, a token field field picture on my front slide here, similar to Pippa, where we were um, in the Bahamas last year to map out some paleo shorelines. Um, so I will move a little bit further away from the ice sheet compared to Pippa's talk and a little bit deeper into, ge into geologic time. Um, we've heard a lot about GIA, we've covered the process, um, so I'm glad that I don't have to go over these details again. Um, and instead, I'm going to jump right in here, which is to look at um, sea level change over the, well, sea level change today or over the Holocene and how it's driven by GIA. And, and um, Pippa referred to this as the background GIA. So I snuck that into the title of the slide here. So this is a prediction um, that shows how much sea level is changing today, um, only as a result of the ongoing adjustment to the last deglaciation. And what um, stands out here, of course, are these areas in red, areas formerly got covered by ice sheets where sea level is falling as a result of post-glacial rebound, and areas in blue here um, where sea level is rising as a result of both eustatic changes, so ice mass loss over this time period, but more importantly, so for today and for the, this rate of change here, um, areas where we're on the peripheral bulge of the former um, ice sheets that are subsiding over, um, over the interglacial time periods. There's also a lot of structure here in the far field um, compared to one of the earlier slides uh, that, that were shown in some of the introductory um, talks. Here we're looking at sea level change millimeters per year, sub millimeter per year, um, which is really it's kind of small scale features in the far field that are hard to detect. And I think we'll hear more about this tomorrow as well. And are definitely on the same order of magnitude as a lot of the other sea level changes that are occurring. But we see um, also patterns here where uh, that are sort of following the coastlines. Um, this kind of halo around the coastline is a result of um, the, the oceans gaining and losing mass over the glacial cycle. And therefore we have ex excess load or reduced load. And I think about these kind of outlines around the continent as sort of the peripheral bulge of the ocean load instead of the peripheral bulge of the ice sheets. And so as a result, we see sort of small scale, this is just a meter here, small scale sea level changes over the Holocene. So we understand, and this, this overall, you know, I'm starting off with kind of the, the general things that I think we understand quite well before I go into the aspects um, that I think we don't under, understand quite well and, and propose um, some paths forward of, of how, uh, paths forward of how we can understand them better. So I think we have a relative good understanding of this first order pattern. In fact, you know, some of these observations were the first to tell us about Earth's viscosity. So Haskell in, 19, in 1935 um, used uplifted shorelines and Fenniscandia to impose and suggest that um, Earth's viscosity is 10 to 21 Pascal seconds, which, which is really a measure that pretty much holds today. And similar work, of course, has been done um, since here's a sort of an emergence curve from um, Hudson Bay where sea level is falling. The crucial aspect um, 
of this work here and that really allows us to tease out viscosity more clearly um, than in other locations is that while the on the right here, the magnitude of how high sea level was at an earlier time depends on how thick the ice sheet was back in time, which is a, a measure we don't know as well. What is not dependent on the ice sheet thickness is that this sort of exponential shape. So the decay time of this exponential shape is pretty much only sensitive to the viscosity. And therefore we can use these rebound um, curves to constrain, to put constraints on the viscosity. Um, there's been a lot of work and, and uh, Pippa um, mentioned this as well, but there's been a lot of work trying, you know, using sea level histories from around the globe and trying to understand um, Earth's viscosity as well as, as well as ice sheet variability over the deglaciation. And I'm highlighting one study here and others exist um, where they use, this is from Kurt Lambeck, and they used a variety of locations that are shown here as black and uh, red markers. And there are sea level records, most Holocene, but also in the during the deglaciation. Um, and they inverted these in an iterative procedure to find the optimal parameters for lithospheric thickness, upper mantle viscosity, lower mantle viscosity, and then propose a resulting kind of global mean sea level history. Um, what they find is they get constraints on the lithospheric thickness that range, and I should say here on, in these, there are two scenarios, um, the, the red and the blue, um, but they find this, what's shown here is misfit on the y-axis and essentially these values that have lowest misfit are the ones that are most likely and best fit the data. Um, they obtain a sort of likely range for lithospheric thickness. These are all one dimensional uh, models in which the viscosity in Earth's structure only varies with depth. They find that the upper mantle has a viscosity of about 10 to 20 and that the lower mantle viscosity has sort of two solutions, one around 10 to 21 and the other around 10 to 23. Um, there has been a history in the community of the debate of what the viscosity is in the lower mantle also using not just sea level observations but also geodetic observations, J2 dot, for example. Here in this specific study, um, what the authors favored was this higher viscosity um, for a couple of reasons, but most notably that it required sort of a smaller Antarctic ice sheet, a smaller ice volume at the last glacial maximum, which as you just heard from Pippa, the sort of updates to the reconstruction of the ice sheet volume over the um, deglaciation from Antarctica sort of come in lower and lower. So as in, as in there's less and less change over the glacial cycle actually. And this is sort of more in line with this, or, um, with this higher viscosity here. And we get a deglacial ice, you know, global mean sea level history that starts with sea level at around 130 meters during the last glacial maximum. And then um, a deglaciation with sort of punctuated um, ice melt that is that in, where in particular the past rates of sea level rise occur during meltwater pulse 1A, meltwater pulse 1B, for example. Um, and those have been used and studied as, you know, um, trying to understand speed limits on ice retreat, which is of course important if we think about the future. So there are details here in these reconstructions that, you know, will differ a little bit from, from study to study, but I think this is the overall you know, there is an overall understanding here. And this is just to um, show this as well. And again, the sort of ice sheet evolution over the last half a million year, half a million years with my major ice sheets in, um, in North America and Fenoscandia, the exact distribution of them is not quite, is not known very well. Um, but we have a, a pretty good, I would say, first order understanding of this ice sheet variability um, you see, of course, here during the interglacials, like this one, the last interglacial, where, you, where um, the sea is actually rebounding, and you see how during glacials, land bridges form and are, you know, disconnected during the deglaciation. There's a lot of connections to archaeology, for example, as well. So this is sort of, you know, this is the biggest picture that I think we have a pretty good sense of. Now we're going to move to thinking about, okay, some of the details that we probably, that I want to, you know, argue that we don't know as well before we move on to how we can understand them better. 
So one of those, you know, I say details, but it's really, it's pretty, pretty significant difference is actually the, this, the, um, the exact geometry of the past ice sheets. And just to demonstrate this here, um, I'm showing you three different Laurentide ice sheet reconstructions at 18,000 years ago. Um, and they are fit to different observations. Some of them are more sort of ice physics based than others, but there are quite significant differences here. And this is, you know, I would say one of the very important areas of ongoing research, really trying to understand these differences. Um, there's a lot more data that can be used and assimilated. And I'll get to that when we talk about kind of the future directions. Along those lines um, of sort of outstanding questions for the deglaciation, there is also a, the question still of what's referred to as the missing ice problem at the last glacial maximum, which means that um, at the, if we look at the, if we look at sea level records from the last glacial maximum, we require an ice volume, an ice equivalent volume that is larger than we can really reasonably distribute among the possible ice sheets. Um, so there's this missing ice. There's some, they're merging some suggestions of how this could be reconciled, but it's certainly not a solved problem. Similarly, thinking about how much, what the contribution is from different ice sheets to meltwater pulse one A and other meltwater events. Um, there is work being done in this direction and, and, and uh, um, which is really interesting, but these are definitely still, that's the level um, of detail that is really important if we want to understand ice sheet variability and that's not, not really understood at the moment. The other big component in the GIA modeling is of course also lateral variability in viscosity and Pe Pippa already you know, gave you a good overview of this. I'm showing you here just to give you a sense of sort of the order of magnitude um, variability that we're expecting. Um, you see lithospheric thickness here in the top left and then variability in viscosity at a couple of upper mantle um, depths. So uh, viscosity likely varies by an order of magnitude or an order of magnitudes. Um, we can, what is used here, um, rely on seismic tomography and rheological laws. Again, Pippa talked about this. Um, there are uncertainties in this. Here we're using some geo geodynamic constraints that, um, to better map uh, shear wave speed into temperature and then into viscosity, but certainly uncertainties remain both in the scaling relationships as well as just the tomography itself. And one aspect to mention here is that during GIA calculations that account for this full variability in viscosity is, is a lot more computationally expensive than doing GIA calculations only that only vary, um, well, we only vary the radial structure of the viscosity. And the reason for that is that, but we only uh, vary whether the structure is radially symmetric, we can actually solve parts of the equations semi-analytically. Well, it's here, this has to be fully numerical in finite volume, finite element, pick your, uh, <laughs> pick your method of choice, but it has to be fully numerical, which makes these calculations, the, the actual you know, sea level calculation um, associated with this earth structure, a lot more computationally expensive. And as a result, a lot harder to explore uncertainty. And as a result, that makes it a lot harder to explore uncertainties. So where does it leave us? So what, what are sort of the data model misfits that we still have for the deglaciation? And I'm just plotting out a couple of um, sites here. You see, you know, different locations here of the deglaciation. You might have noticed that time for me sometimes goes in one direction or in the other direction. So you always have to, you know, keep an eye out for that. So here it goes towards the left with the present being on the left. And I am showing you sea level data um, as sea level index points, which mark sea level. Um, marine limiting, which are, uh, which mean that sea level has to be higher than that. And terrestrial limiting, which means that sea level has to be lower than that from a series of locations and the locations are kind of grouped locations and the locations are shown here on this plot. The prediction that I'm showing here is the ice um, 6 gvm 5 sea level prediction. Um, and this is, you know, a great sea level model and sea level prediction that's widely used. What's great about it is that it's actually, you know, very easily available and, and it's been shared widely, which is 
think one of the reasons why it's so widely used. It fits some of the sea level observations. So it's, it's a model that assumes, you know, radial, radially symmetric viscosity. Um, so it fits, you know, quite well in some locations um, here, possibly up here. Um, and there are other locations where it doesn't or it fits in Barbados very well. These, the Barbados data also went into constructing this ice model. And then it doesn't fit so well at other locations, right? And I pick these somewhat randomly, just not to kind of show that this model is, 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 a, is not a good model, but just to show any ice model that you were, were to choose would, you know, do better in some locations and not so well in other locations. And it's a result of the uncertainty that we have in the ice reconstruction and the uncertainty that we have in the viscosity structure. So how can we move forward here? How can we come up with a model, with a GIA model that actually fits these observations well? Um, and that does allow at the same time for variability in Earth's viscosity. I'm gonna kind of propose one suggestion here of an approach. And just to, before I go into that, you know, just here's sort of the, the setup of the problem, right? We have our GIA model. What goes in is the, the ice and ocean loading. So the ice, uh, most notably the ice sheet reconstruction, the ocean loading is calculated from the ice reconstruction. Um, and the earth rheology that goes, that's input into a GIA model. The output is our solid earth deformation, it's relative sea level change and other um, quantities. We can, we make a prediction, we can compare that to sea level, sea level observations and then adjust the ice and the earth model accordingly. So the crux here is of course, what does it mean to adjust the ice and the earth model accordingly? And I'm gonna sh show you one approach of how to do this now where we're just gonna be adjusting the earth model and we're gonna lend um, the methodology from seismology. So essentially what, you know, this, it's a, what we wanna solve is an inverse problem. Um, and, you know, when I started working on this, I thought, thought about this in terms of seismic tomography. And since this is a solid earth crowd, I thought this would be a good analogy to set up this, uh, this approach. As you all know, seismic tomography, we have an earthquake, we have a seismic stations, waves travel through Earth's interior, and we measure um, the seismic speed at the, at the seismic station. There, there are sensitivity kernels in the Earth's interior that connect where the earthquake happens and where the seismic station records the seismic waves. And that means these are the areas that whatever the, where the seismic wave that travels through the mantle um, is sensitive to a fast or slow structure. Um, so we have these sensitivity kernels here, which are sort of the darkened areas. And if we have a structure that is a feature in the mantle that is um, slow, the wave will, will arrive later than expected. If it's fast, it will arrive faster than expected. And we can take that knowledge, right? That mismatch between the observation, what we expected and what actually happened um, to update the internal structure. And here we go, that gives us our seismic tomography. We can do um, the same thing with sea level observations. So, um, and this is work that's been um, pioneered by David Alatar and, um, and a student, Ophelia Crawford. Crawford. So what he's calculated here is a sensitivity kernel for the viscoelastic deformation problem. So if you were to imagine that the ice load is just a, a, a point load, which of course in reality it isn't, but just for analogy sense, and our re rebound observation is a point observation, which it is, then we can calculate the sensitivity kernel for the physics of this problem. And we find a sensitivity that's actually quite similar to the, the sort of banana donut seismic sensitivity kernels. Um, we can calculate these sensitivity kernels in a 3D earth model very cheaply by using adjoint equations, which have been used in seismology and geodynamics and now are also derived for the GIA loading problem. So what does the sensitivity kernel look like, not for an idealized point load and point station, but actually for a real world extensive ice sheet, as well as kind of a sea level record. And that's shown here. So we're looking at sensitivity kernels 
um, that have a specific ice history, you know, that are the results of a specific ice history. Um, we're looking at a station. So we have, you know, the Lawrence Hyde and the Penobscanian Ice Sheet, as I showed you this before. And we have a station here that's uh, located in Bonaparte Gulf. We're looking at the sensitivity kernel at two depths here, at a thousand kilometer depth and at 2000 kilometer depths. And you see that there are areas, essentially you see the areas that are red and blue are the areas that this specific um, observation, so the sea level record at this side is sensitive to. And you see it's sensitive to structure right underneath the, um, the where the record is, where the sea level record is. And it's sensitive to the area ice loading. Again, similar to tomography, for seismic tomography, we can use the knowledge here where if we have, um, uh, if we have a positive viscosity kernel here in blue, um, we know that if we increase viscosity in that region, we will increase local sea level. Whereas if we have a negative viscosity kernel, say in red here, we know that increasing viscosity will lead to a decrease in the actual sea level prediction. And this is fantastic because it gives us a means of updating and inferring 3D earth structure based on a data model misfit. And I'm gonna show you an example of how this can work with a synthetic test. So the synthetic test here is that we're gonna use the same database that I showed you earlier from this uh, Lambeck paper. So this is sort of the geographic range of where we have sea level observations. And we're gonna set up a um, you know, a known 3D viscosity structure of the earth. And we want to then, we then produce data with this known 3D viscosity structure. And then we use the data to back out and infer back what the um, viscosity variability was and compare how close we got to um, the known structure, right? So this is all synthetic, no real data in here. So we're putting, you know, this is a, this is the viscosity model that we assume to be um, correct. Um, this is based on the S20 RTS uh, seismic, uh, seismic model. We use a, you know, a, a fixed ice, ice sheet geometry. We're not in, inverting for ice geometry here at all. The data are in the far field, so details in the ice geometry probably don't matter as much. Um, but if we go to a global scale, of course we don't, you know, there's uncertainty in this which we're neglecting here in this, in this simplest case scenario. And we run forward projections of sea level at these different locations and produce our synthetic data. We assume this, the data have no uncertainty, okay? So perfect data, again, easiest setup. And then we start with no variations in viscosity and use our, that inversion scheme, those sensitivity kernels, to update what the actual earth structure, what the earth structure looks like, and then compare it to the true values. And I'll show, I'll show you the results for that in a second. This is an iterative approach because we get updates to our viscosity structure, then again, do forward predictions compared to, observ compared to our synthetic observation, update the viscosity structure. And it's if we use far field data, it's pretty well behaved. If we use near field data, it gets a little bit trickier. Um, and we can also, you know, test, do we actually match our observations after those iterations? And that's shown here. So this is our synthetic data is shown in black. Um, the initial 1D Earth model, um, so where we started with is in, in is the dashed blue line. And then in uh, the red is the inverted um, result. So we see, okay, our inversion met, matches the observation. This is great but do we actually map out the correct earth structure, right? So I'm showing you here on the left and I'm gonna go through this kind of depth by depth, what the viscosity structure is that we get out. And, you know, ideally, if this is a perfect inversion, it looks exactly like this. In reality, you will already expect that it, can't, it can never look like this because our data really is mostly located in these regions. So we don't really have any information in big parts of the earth. But let's just look at the regions where we do have data, okay? So this is our um, in, inverted, or the result of our inversion, um, the inverted viscosity structure. We see sort of higher viscosity here and around here, 
lower viscosity here, which does, you know, are features that do to first order match up with the, with the, with the true um, with the true viscosity structure. We also see this sort of higher viscosity, uh, sorry, um, lower viscosity here, which is a little bit present, but not quite as striking. If we go to 500 kilometers depth, we see quite nicely that we are mapping, you know, the subduction zone here. We're mapping these high viscosity slabs that are in our, in the true model. And we continue to map this low viscosity zone here we're starting to pick up this high viscosity, which is not really present at this slice. But if we go a little bit deeper, we're seeing sort of some bleeding into the between the depth slices where it's starting to pick up this high viscosity here. Again, continue this, these features. And one slice deeper, you know, we see some of this variability in the Pacific. Um, so I would argue that we're sort of actually matching and are able to map some of the first order features um, in the viscosity structure. Uh, we can actually quantify this and look at the correlation between what we know is the true viscosity and our inverted viscosity. Um, the left shows you the correlation coefficient between the two. Red is we're doing really well, this is depth integrated. We're doing really well in recovering the viscosity structure. Blue means it's actually anti-correlated. So we're getting the opposite of what we should. Get. So blue is bad, red's good. Um, you see overall on the, uh, along in, in the whole globe, we don't, in some regions we do better in other regions we don't do well at all. However, if we only look at regions where we actually update the viscosity, so we're actually feeding information into an hour, our inversion, we are left with these regions um, that all have really high correlation. So we are actually able to kind of recover some of the 3D structure um, through this um, tomography, viscosity tomography. So um, here's the dream, my dream, <laughs> is to move towards such a tomo such tomographic imaging of um, Earth's 3D viscosity. I think the key part here is that it's towards a tomographic image. There are a couple of um, very important caveats that make this very difficult, but I think still possible. And I'm gonna end with showing you our um, reflecting on a, some, uh, on a few of these complications. So one is of course that we need more data and more data exist. So this is a compilation of the Holocene sea level data that are available. There have been great community efforts um, from the Holocene working group to compile and standardize Holocene sea level data. So we can start working with them. There are obvious spatial gaps that, you know, as you just saw it in the inversion, we don't have data, we don't have any information. So the more data we have over this time period, the better this imaging of the viscosity will work. Um, and I should also say that the, the time period, we're mostly limited to the Holocene, where not that much ice change happens. So if we have more deglacial records, it would be better. Those are of course the much harder to get to because they're, most of them are submerged today. We can also start incorporating present day constraints, GPS, gravity, and there was already a lot of talk about that today. Ice sheet reconstructions need to be improved. I, you know, I, I talked to you about some of the outstanding questions here. In these inversions, we can explore trade-offs between inverting for ice, ice or inverting for the Earth's viscosity. Um, but there's, I think, a lot of data that aren't actually assimilated in these, and this goes more into Pippa's direction on the on the cryospheric side, but I think there's a lot of data that we can leverage to actually distinguish between which of these ice sheet reconstructions is, is, is right. So beyond sea level data and, and present day constraints, there are pluvial and proglacial lakes all around here that have tilted shorelines that we can use. People have used river routing um, across here, across here, across here, that tell us something about the GIA signal. We could use eskers to constrain the subglacial hydrology of the Laurentide ice sheets. People have also used um, constraints from atmospheric circulation. Um, so there, it's kind of you know an eclectic set of constraints, but bringing those together, um, and not just in with a you know handmade ice model, but with a physics-based ice model, would really I think push this field forward significantly. And I should say there are people who are doing this, and that's um, and that's great. 
there is, of course, also still a lot to be done on this assimilation techniques. You know, I had described um, a gradient based optimization using adjoints. Um, there are other other approaches out there and it'll be great to see them. The, the, the drawback, there are a lot of advantages to the approach that I described to you. Drawbacks are that we find, you know, a, a, a global, we find a local minimum. That means we find one possible solution. We don't actually get a good sense of uncertainty. This is a problem not unique to this community, but to, size, to the seismic community, to the geodynamics community. And um, approaches like looking at, you know, there are approaches out there and actually, you know, working together across the solid earth sciences. I think we can learn a lot um, from each other here. I also would advocate for better benchmarking. Um, people have done benchmarking for radially symmetric GIA models and Wouter van der Waal has led some of those efforts. Um, but I think on the 3D GIA models as um, they have not been benchmarked and I think they should be benchmarked and it's boring work, but it's really important. Um, and if, of course, you know, on the rheological parameters, the better our constraints on the, the, the viscosity structure from seism from other disciplines is the better the starting model in such an inversion, the better our end result. Um, I may, you know, dream about joint inversions between, you know, doing a seismic inversion, a geodynamic inversion, and a GIA inversion together, which may be, might be possible at some point, and I think would be really, really amazing. And I think this is my last point here, which is, um, also on the rheological properties, and Peppa mentioned this, but everything I told you was assuming a Maxwell rheology, a single dash pod and a spring. But it's very likely that the Earth, Earth has transient behavior. Um, for example, burgers are sort of an extended burgers material, um, which we know from laboratory experiments. At high stress, high strain locations, especially close to the ice sheet, we might move into dislocation creep. That means stress dependent um, deformation. So the rheology of a Maxwell body is something that we also need to you know, reconsider. Um, and there's work being done in this direction, but I, I think there will be a lot more in the next decade. And oh no, this is the last point. And I'm gonna just end on this very quickly, but I think, and Pippa and, uh, and Chris mentioned this, but I think one really exciting aspect of this, of looking at the deglaciation is that the records are becoming better and better resolving smaller scale variability. And here's a record that shows you sort of centennial variability in sea level, um, which you know might not be a GIA process, but might be an oceanographic process, or might be related to sedimentation, terrestrial water st storage variability. So a lot of the processes that we will hear about tomorrow a lot, I think. Um, I, I think the community is starting to be able to pick those up and separate them out from GIA, which I think is another avenue that um, I'm certainly very excited about. So to summarize and, and finish up here, um, we understand the general deglacial ice sheet evolution and Earth's internal structure, and this builds on decades of work from a lot of you know, fantastic scientists. But I think there's improvements um, that start now allow us to um, map 3D variability in Earth's viscosity, better understand some of the important detailed but very important ice dynamic features, and interpret signals associated with ocean dynamics, or I should say really just non-GIA processes. Um, a lot of work I think is still needed to actually get there. Um, on the data assimilation technique side, on the benchmarking side, including more physics-based ice models. Pippa said it, right? Getting GIA models together with ice sheet modelers and, and, and um, observational data people, that's the dream team. Um, getting diverse, assimilating diverse types of data, being creative about that, getting better coverage, um, and then connecting to some of these other disciplines that have you know, complementary knowledge that we need. And I didn't really motivate my work at the beginning because it was motivated through all the other talks. But if we have this better understanding, of course, it affects present day sea level changes. It affects our knowledge about the feedback of solid earth and ice sheets as Pepper um, elaborated on. And it also affects our study of sea level during past warm periods, periods of rapid change, for example, meltwater events that all are really important to understand ice dynamics and sea level change into the future. 
And I'm gonna um, stop here and I'm really happy to take any questions. Great, thanks a lot, Jackie. That was another great talk. Um, I think what I'd like to do is let's switch to both Jackie and Pippin. We'll take questions for both um, together and just go into a general discussion of both talks um, at this point. And I think to start off, I think Thorsten has a question. So maybe we can start with him. Thanks, Mark. Um, thanks to, to both of you for great talks. And I'm, you know, I'm, I have a billion questions and I'm really very excited, right, that three-dimensional variations in viscosity have now become something that, you know, uh, people outside the geodynamics community are excited about because we've been at this forever and we kind of had a hard time getting, getting at it. But when you bring in the sea level and you realize the feedbacks with the cryosphere, it becomes much more relevant, obviously, for society. And so there are obviously like a number of ways to get at the different spatial temporal scales of viscosity from geodesy, from geoid, and, 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 and from sea level exchange. And I guess I have a number of questions that are to do with that, maybe sort of specifically starting out and then someone else, you know, can, can pick up on this. For Jackie, so you showed these really um, amazing adjoint based inversions for lateral viscosity variations, which is, I think, exactly the, the right approach. But I was very surprised that you had deep sensitivity for viscosity in these wet rods, right? And so my understanding is when you look at GIA alone, then the length scale of the ice load gives you a pretty good idea about how deep you're sensing. And then you do sort of a fairly localized average. Now, GIA with the sea level equation then brings in the geoid response. So I presume it's this geoid response and the flexure of the lithosphere that Pippa really nicely illustrated that gives you a bit of a deeper sensitivity. but when the geodynamicists try to get at lateral viscosity variations from the geoid or dynamic topography, it's always like, eh, because those are mainly sensitive to density rather than viscosity. And so the rates are much better. So I wonder what is it when you go to sea level that then gives you that deeper sensitivity that also appears to be sort of less localized? Yeah, I would say two things come to mind here. Um, one is that that what you just described, right, we think about and the rule of thumb is the sensitivity of and the depth sensitivity of the ice sheet is kind of the size of the ice sheet roughly, right? Um, so for the long tide, people say I think a thousand kilometers is the depth sensitivity. But this applies to if you look at viscosity in the rebounding area. But we are not looking at, I mean, we're not only looking at area at sense at um, sea level in that in the same location where we also have that load change. So if you were to map out the sensitivity kernel for a site um, for a sea level record in Hudson Bay, that's exactly what you'd get. You'd get sort of a sensitivity kernel that extends to about a thousand kilometers. But since we're measuring kind of further away, we are getting this broader sensitivity. Um, the other part is that it's not just the ice load that changes over the glacial cycle, but it's also the ocean load. And the ocean load is a much larger spatial feature and contributes to kind of a greater depth sensitivity. Um, right. Yeah. So that was sort of my question. This ocean loading, right? That gives you a georic kind of feeling thing that is that is yeah. global. But yeah. but why does that better than you know looking at say the effect of internal density distributions? Is it because the forcing is different? Right, because what? when we do when we do internal density variations and internal viscosity variations, the ge geoid doesn't much care. Right, but but your sensitivity analysis says that when you look at these surface loads, it seems to be more sensitive to lateral viscosity variations. Yes, is your sorry, is your question whether it's um, the trade off with density? No, the, the question is where does the sensitivity come from compared to other geoid forward modeling studies that mental dynamicists have done? Yeah, I mean, I I would say it's the the combination of both of those. I mean, you're seeing, if you look at the, if the, um, if you think about the, the figure that I showed you with the point load of your ice sheet and the point load or, or the point measurement of your sea level record, you are getting a kernel that is sort of banana donut shaped. Um, and so that just gives you sensitivity. I mean, there's trade-offs, right? If you, you can't accommodate all of that in the upper mantle, but you, you are getting sensitivity 
um, in the lower mantle from that as well. Um, I think next we have a question from Maya. Hey, yeah, I actually have a couple of questions, but um, first of all, thank you to you both. That was such such fabulous and informative and, and uh, clear talks. Thank you. I'll 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 start with with uh, Pippa, and both my questions are very simple <laughs> compared to Thorsten's. They're really just um, for my own clarification. So, uh, Pippa, you talked about how this difference in viscosity is um, is is going to affect whether or not the the glacier retreats. Um, because of how it how it responds, Can, and, and I saw I know this is buried somewhere in your in your plots that, that you were looking at sort of a maybe a thousand year time scale, but could you expand a little bit on uh, like exactly how much difference it makes in terms of time and how quickly um, it is responding to these differences? In viscosity. Yeah, I I think um, actually what you've asked there is um, what we were grappling with at the moment. Um, the, some people are looking at very short time scales um, and often they're running models which can run at higher spatial resolution. Um, and so you're sort of resolving the processes, the, the detail of the rebound. Um, if you, I think it's important to say, if you run ice sheet models at different spatial resolutions, you'll get different answers. Um, some of those ones which are run for very long time scales are fundamentally slightly different, have different sensitivity to the forcing you applied, um, to the, the climate forcing essentially. Um, so that's just something to make you aware of. Um, the, what we think is happening in somewhere like Pine Island in, in Antarctica is that um, we can trigger a response to ice loss within a decade, which is um, a couple of orders of magnitude greater than just the elastic rebound, which we traditionally um, assumed was happening. And we know that because the GPS are recording rates, which are a couple of orders, mag uh, sorry, a couple of times greater, um, you know, two or three times greater um, than the elastic response. Um, we're building that into models that are run over decadal and centennial scales. Um, but we're very much looking at specific processes there. We're asking the question of what can the earth do? Um, other models will be um, thinking about ice shelf processes, ocean processes in there as well. Um, and I, I think it's fair to say that there's lots of different groups tackling these different forces. Um, and some of those longer timescale ones necessarily try and combine all of those, but maybe with, with less detail. Um, I think there's, it's not surprising that we're getting different answers for long-term projections at the moment. Thank you. It's one of the things I really uh, loved about your talk is you so so clearly illustrated how complex it is and how and how how dependent these different feedbacks are on each other. And and so I guess that that completely makes sense <laughs> given that overall theme in your talk. So thank you. Um, and I'll I'll just switch. Can I can I ask one more question of Jackie? Go right ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Jackie, with your, with your um, seismic tomography models, there, you know, one of the things that always uh, makes me nervous about seismic tomography models is their blobbiness, particularly in the uh, shallow mantle and particularly uh, under the ocean basins where, um, where we have so few measurements. I mean, obviously you can measure it other ways with bounces, but um, how confident are you in those in those shallow models? And does the does getting the shallow viscosity right um, does that disproportionately impact your results versus the deeper viscosity? Yeah. So I mean, in the if we use um, a viscosity viscosity derived from seismic tomography, we're really at the mercy of the resolution of the tomography, right? By just through the process of converting that into viscosity, we can't really add any more resolution to it. Um, that using the sea level observations as independent constraints on the viscosity might be able to help with that. But I think the resolution that we're going to get, and you saw this a little bit in the, in the synthetic case, the resolution that we're going to get is also going to be very blobby or very smooth out, right? It's really the first order feature that we possibly can um, start to, to resolve. Um, 
the question of whether that is, you know, a concern or is, is something, um, yeah, that needs, that is particularly important, I guess it depends on um, where you're looking. If you're looking in Antarctica um, and you're looking at a location where you have your ice sheet melt and you have your station right next to it, you're going to be very sensitive to what happens in the upper mantle there. If you're looking at a site that's further, and that also applies, say, if you're looking along the U.S. East Coast, the upper mantle is really important. The further you go um, away from the ice load, the less important that sort of oceanic upper mantle structure is. Um, and mapping out these sensitivity kernels can actually help us answer that exact question because they're telling us which part of the of the mantle we're you know seeing that observation um, is seeing. So I would say it depends. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, maybe actually just to segue off of that, Jackie, in terms of the spatial um, variations and viscosity, there's a question from the audience about whether you can comment on the sharp spatial variation in lithospheric thickness in Africa, 50 to 300 kilometers. What's the evidence for it and, and what might have caused it? Yeah, so we're seeing you know, some of the um, strong gradients and the lithospheric um, thickness are once we move on to kind of a continental craton. So, you know, this, the models that I showed are derived from seismic tomography and they sort of map out the craton in those regions, which just have a much higher, you know, thicker core, you know, thicker lithosphere than the, than, um, the surrounding regions. So that drives those kind of relatively stark spatial gradients. Great, thanks. Um, we have a question from Jessica Warren. Uh, thanks. Um, thanks, Jackie and Pippa for a great talk. So it was um, really interesting. And my talk uh, kind of follows up on what Maya was asking about, which is I'm curious with upper mantle rheology, um, you know, if you, for example, put in dislocation creep, which I think the seismic data suggests in many areas is dominating um, what does that do? And maybe the, the other question is why the preference for diffusion creep? Is it just that it's computationally easier? Um, and uh, just in terms of like moving towards a closer rheology for what we think is there, can, you know, can we go in that direction of putting dislocation creep in? I can start on that, but I'm also happy to then hand it off to Pippa because I think particularly in Antarctica, people have are looking at that more than in other places. Um, in general, I think that the choice of using Maxwell is just that, you know, start with the simplest model that can explain the data. Um, there are definitely um, approach, you know, um, it's not actually that, I mean, that more computationally expensive to run different those different rheologies that aren't, that are still one dimensional. Um, so it's possible and people have, are doing it you're sort of adding, you know, more free parameters to the inversion, but I, I think it's it's necessary. And ideally, they're not fully free parameters, but they're parameters that are actually constrained from by the, you know, the laboratory experiments. Um, but yeah, the initial choice for Maxwell is just for starting with the simplest model. And people have looked at this in particular in Antarctica. So I, I don't know, Pippa, if you want to add to that. Yeah, I, I, it would be good to, um just uh, flag up some work. So I I run a 3D GIA model um, in Antarctica, um, working with Wouter van der Waal, where we do include um, dislocation and diffusion creep. Um, as Jackie says, it's, it's computationally more expensive. Um, a problem that we hit there is how to parameterize things like water content and grain size. Um, we, the model we have at the moment, um, we just choose a, a uniform value for water content of the mantle um, underneath Antarctica, partly because we don't know any better. Um, we find very different estimates of viscosity depending on that water content, which obviously has knock-on implications for the GIA model. Um, an area to flag up, um, I'm not super familiar with it, um, but I'm aware that magnetotellurics can tell us a little bit about water content in the mantle. Um, and, and luckily people, in that field are looking to Antarctica um, and potentially introducing some observations there, which will help constrain that bit of the problem. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, thinking about um, temporal variations in, in mantle viscosity, so the dependence of viscosity and stress is something which is sort of high up um, on the radar in Antarctica because 
um, we're able to get these areas of rapid ice sheet change and see the rebound. And we can't quite model that rebound um, with a Maxwell rheology at the moment. Thanks. I, so I'm going to cut Mark off just say that I was happy to hear water invoked as well, because that seems like one of the easier parameters to allow you to have viscosity variations laterally as well. Um, I think uh, I'm going to go. We have a question now from Cindy, Cindy Evinger. Yeah, um, whoops, I don't know, um, sorry, something odd just happened. Um, I was going to ask both of you um, how we, I mean, one of our, our roles on the, on the committee is to find ways, um, look for intersections or, or ways to support the community. And, and it seems that particularly with, um, well, with both of your talks that you have strong advice to where new observations should be collected, where, where new um, stations should be installed. And so is there adequate dialogue between the observationalists, particularly say in Antarctica, um, where there's a specialist community? And, and I'm just saying, I, I've, um, I've heard a whole series of talks um, on Antarctica related to research of colleagues here. Um, and I and I'm not. Sh it, it just seems like there's there's potentially disconnects. I'm wondering how we could help with the community um, ha com share the modeling results to better inform data acquisition. So I'll, I'll pick that up because you you mentioned Antarctica there, Cindy. Um, I think you've you've almost flipped around the answer that I was going to give. Um, by saying, can we share them those model predictions? And that's um, that's actually an interesting um, direction. Um, and there are um, there are studies more around the northern hemisphere ice sheets asking the question of where could we get data that would help our modeling approaches. That's not really been done so much for Antarctica. Um, I think the general approach is if we can get any data, we're just grateful because it's uh, logistically so challenging. Um, but I think that's an interesting direction to be more targeted in um, identifying specific observations um, that would be helpful for the, for the modeling would be interesting. Um, and Antarctica is an interesting um, location. It's obviously very challenging to get to um, and carry out field work, but it's actually also an area where perhaps there's the most collaboration in the world um, because of that, of that challenge. So starting those conversations um, is actually, uh, you often get quite a long way there. I can add to it from the sort of far field perspective. Um, there is some work that asks specifically, right, what are the areas that are most sensitive to the parameters that we can want to constrain and then go there and, and, and look at observations. But of course, you know, you're constrained by not every location is, has the data that we're looking for. Not every location is accessible. It's not, you know, there's a reason why most of around around Africa doesn't have any of the Holocene data in this in this database, right? So they have logistical, you know, similar to Antarctica, logistical difficulties there as well. But there is definitely that conversation. And I would say a little bit less so on the what where should we go to collect data, but a lot more what's happening more and more over the last you know decade and hopefully more and more so in the next decade is sharing just between and the, the just starting to have that conversation between the observational science and the data modeling. So the, the Halsey, what I mentioned, just even collecting, compiling the data in a way that is meaningful and useful for the modeling community and vice versa, produ producing um, model predictions and making them available that, that, that then are also useful for observational scientists. I think that's the stage we're probably at at the moment. Um, and it's, it's picking up, which is really, really great to see. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Um, Jeff Fremuller, I think you had a question. If I can get, yeah, hi there. Actually, uh, my question was almost exactly the same as Cindy's. So I'll just say thanks to Pippa and Jackie for great talks. Really appreciated it. Great. Actually, I'm going to use my uh, prerogative right here for just a quick second to ask you guys both, one of you can maybe explain 
something to me that I've always wondered about. So we often in like intro geology talks, just talk about, you know, if you have a ice shelf and it breaks off, it doesn't change sea level, right? Because it's already floating. But thinking about these fingerprints, I'm curious, how does that map, or the, is, is that fingerprint talking only about grounded ice that's melting? I would assume though that that gravitational effect would actually also pertain to floating ice directly adjacent to an ice sheet. Is that true? I'm, I really don't know the answer. I'm very curious what it is. Shall I have a go at that one, Jackie? Um, uh, so my, uh, my way of thinking about ice shelves is that they're already in the ocean. Um, so obviously, as you said, if they break off, they don't change the sea level. Um, so I'm now struggling with the concept of the gravitational attraction of the ice shelf. And um, I, I have a hunch that it doesn't affect it because it's displacing ocean water, which would other set. Yeah, I'm struggling with this answer. <laughs> um, you're absolutely right that um, when they break off, they don't change the sea level. Um, I don't think they are massive enough um, to have the same sort of effect um, as a change in the volume of the grounded ice sheet behind. Um, if you think about them then transporting it into the ocean, it's, um, it's just mass moving around. It's not mass changing. Um, it, it melts into the ocean essentially. And what the models do is they, they do account for the self gravitation of the ocean itself. So I think I may be getting back to my first statement is that if you count them as being part of the ocean, um, then it is accounted for in these models of, of considering the distribution of mass throughout the system. So even though an isostatic continental mountain range would deflect the gravitational attraction due to the floating route, that wouldn't be the case for an ice shelf. I think so. Yeah, so, so I, I think that's right, Pippa, what you said, right? It's the same mass and the ma mass is in the end what matters for gravity. So I think it doesn't have, I would assume that it doesn't have a change on gravity. And, and since you mentioned mountain glaciers, if the ice melts and you allow the mountain, the mountain to rebound, there's actually also no gravitational effect. But because there's a delay in the rebound, um, you'll have you know, that initial change in gravity that then is slowly being made up. Um, and I would also add, which isn't exactly what you asked, but um, the ice shelf have a really important buttressing role. So as soon as you lose the ice shelf, right, everything else yeah. can go. Yeah, 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 obviously, that's right. Mm. that's right. Great, well, thank you both for both great talks and stimulating um, discussion. I'm gonna throw it back now um, to Steve Nerum, uh, who's gonna do a quick wrap up for the day. All right, thanks, Mark. Well, these talks have uh, all been great and uh, it's a lot to summarize, but I'm gonna take a stab at it here and I apologize if I missed some points, but uh, I think what we heard today is that uh, first satellite measurements are providing a lot of new information about sea level change, including sea surface height, and ice sheet height, and ice sheet mass changes. Um, and that's telling us that sea level is rising and the rate of that rise is accelerating. And that this is being caused by a combination of melting ice and thermal expansion of the oceans, both of which are being driven by global warming. Uh, there's a lot of regional variations in sea level rise due to the fingerprints of the ice sheet mass loss on sea level and variations in where the oceans absorb the excess heat from global warming. So I think we also heard that the big uncertainty for projecting future sea level change, uh, the elephant in the room, someone said, is determining how quickly the large ice sheets will melt. We also heard about uh, studies of relative sea level data, such as tide gauge data, that are important for studying the the, both the solid or geophysical effects as well as sea level change and understanding isostatic adjustment, tectonics, uh, sediment compaction, subsidence, et cetera. So by combining the, this relative sea level data with knowledge of solid earth geophysics, we can make progress towards not only understanding the solid earth, but also ocean circulation and ultimately climate change. Um, changes in the ocean currents and circulation can have major impacts on sea level change along the coasts. 
Uh, for example, changes in the Gulf Stream will have a big impact on how much sea level change we see along the east coast of the US. Uh, we also discussed uh, that we don't fully understand the feedbacks between ice sheet dynamics and solid deformation, but we know that 3D variations in Earth rheology matter. And it's going to be important for determining how solid earth deformation impacts ice sheet dynamics, as well as the regional variability on sea level change due to the ice sheets and the fingerprints they make on the oceans and sea level. Uh, the impact on ice sheet dynamics will depend on how quickly the solid earth deforms due to the ice mass loss and what the spatial pattern of this deformation is. And so map mapping mantle viscosity is critical for understanding these interactions and their feedbacks. We also learned how paleo sea level records are being used to, to understand the Earth's internal structure and the drivers of ice contributions to sea level change. Uh, distribution of past ice sheet loads is a major air source here and is important for modeling glacial isostatic adjustment and other effects. Uh, approaches from seismic tomography have been used to study the Earth's sentinel structure. Um, and so viscosity tomography is a new tool for doing this. And we're starting to map 3D variations in Earth viscosity using these techniques. However, we also need to consider other changes in sea level not related to GIA, such as ocean dynamics. And so it's gonna be important for scientists from many different fields to work together to solve these problems of uh, understanding how the solid earth is contributing to ice sheet dynamics. And I would say in closing, personally, the, uh, I think sea level science is very much an interdisciplinary problem. And so, you know, getting oceanographers and geophysicists and geodesists and others working together to understand these problems is going to be critical to move forward. So uh, I'll stop there and just say on behalf of the committee, I want to thank all of our speakers today. They were all great talks. I'd also like to thank everybody in the audience for joining us today and the questions that we got. So I also want to note that tomorrow we're going to be continuing this meeting with a few talks on vertical crustal motion and how that uh, contributes to sea level change. Those will begin at uh, noon Eastern time tomorrow. So thanks everybody and we'll see you tomorrow.